Black curtains. How like a shroud they are. Eh, forgive me, Hastings. The melancholy overcomes me often of late. I thank you for joining me on this night. The blackout. The air raid sirens. It is not a night to be alone, Nespa. I couldn't agree more, old chap. I have the bonny day. How we will pass the hours until we know for certain if tonight at last the bombers come. You have asked me to tell you of the murder that occurred most recently at the Smuggler's Rest Hotel on Seadrift Island. I know I have revealed little beyond the fact that Poirot was able to use their little grey cells to bring the affair to a satisfactory conclusion. Yet the newspapers have said nothing. To think that a case of Poirot's does not merit at least a single paragraph is yet one more outrage I lay at the feet of Herr Hitler. He gobbles up space in the newspaper the way he gobbles up so much of Europe, including my own beloved Belgium. But tonight, I propose to take our minds off of the horrors of war. I will not only share with you the events as they happened, but more. You have often complained in your very charming British way, oh, so polite, that Poirot withholds important facts and clues from you, so that you have no opportunity to solve yourself the crime. It's true. Bon, I have applied the gray cells, and a solution has presented itself. Here is your opportunity, mon ami. I will tell the story so vividly to you that you will think you are there yourself. You will direct Poirot's every action. Every fact, every clue will be there in front of your eyes. I will eliminate any characters without a part in a little drama. The hotel? It was not as understaffed as you will see it. In the same spirit, I set the stage. Oh, do not concern yourself with missing rooms, Hastings. Only those locations of importance will be presented. There will be no distractions. You will solve the case even as I did. Oh, Putetra, with a little hint here and there from the magical device you see there on that table. But no doubt, it will not be necessary. Magical device? It is called the Finger of Suspicion. It was given to me by a wizard, someone for whom I did a small favor last year in Manchester. A wizard, eh? Bien, sir. All you need to do is place one of these cards in the center of the machine. They each represent one of the players in our story. I will wave my hands above it so, utter the secret incantation, and it will point you in the right direction. Well, for starters, it's complete rot. I know you, Poirot. If anyone has a more practical, clear-eyed view of how this world works, I haven't met him. You don't believe in magic. If you want to choose this method of giving me hints, I won't stop you. It'll be a treat to see you cavorting about like a stage prestigitator. But I suspect the hints will somehow be coming from you. If you are so certain it is nothing but hocus pocus, then would you be willing to try and solve the mystery of the finger of suspicion, as well as the murder on Seadrift Island? Absolutely. Very well. I will give you seven clues at times of my choosing throughout the evening. Perhaps when you have all seven, you will be able to see the true genius behind the finger of suspicion. Here is your first clue. Power. Power? The power of magic? I give you the clues, Hastings. Do not expect me to explain them as well. Explore my office first. Equip yourself for your journey into the past. Come to me when you are ready. In the meantime, I will tell you three little stories to whet your appetite. Me Ye gentlemen of England, who live home at your ease, this little do you think of the dangers of the sea. When we receive our orders, we are obliged to go on the main to proud Spain, where the stormy winds do blow.
Saints preserve me! Make of these stories what you will, mon ami. They are each related most closely to the events on Sea Drift Island that you and I are about to explore. Keep them in mind. Explore my office first. Equip yourself for your journey into the past. When you are ready to begin your investigation, tell me. My story, it will commence, and you will have your chance to solve the mystery. The line it is out of service, Hastings. There is electricity, but a disconnection it exists somewhere. I am assured by my landlord that it will be functioning again in the morning. Wise choice, Hastings. With this stopwatch, you will be able to determine the time it would take the suspects to make their way to the scene of the murder.
Things are progressing exactly as I expected. This looks important. I will keep it in my notebook. This document bears further study. I will keep it in my notebook. Interesting. I'll put it in my notebook. This may be important. I'll keep it in my notebook. Notice how the portrait is now of Poirot. When you wish us to return to my flat, you have only to touch my portrait. They are blackout curtains, although at the moment they are not wrong. Although I am sure that this site would amuse you, Hastings, Warrow will not engage in such activities for the duration of this tale. Latched tight on the inside. No, no. The door, it will not budge. Eh, uh, pardon, mademoiselle. What is your name? Gladys, sir. Oh, sir. If it's about the towels, the delivery hasn't come yet from the mainland. And that will is ever so unreliable. There is no hurry. Poirot has completed his toilette. Well, if it's the bed, I'll get to it when I can. There's so much to do. Do not trouble yourself. You seem out of sorts. Is something wrong? Oh, no, sir. No, not really. There, there. What is it? It's that Will Jenks, if you must know. What can you tell me of Sea Drift Island? Only that I wouldn't stay around here after dark. Why not? There's a ghost. Old Tom Cutter's ghost. A smuggler and a pirate. Murdered he was. Shot down by government agents after his gold. You have seen this ghost? I haven't, but many have. 
He haunts the pub here on the island what's closed now. You seem quite angry with this Will Jenks. Will? Oh, he thinks quite a bit of himself, he does. Just because a girl might go with him to the films in Kingsbridge or have a bit to eat at the local, he thinks he's got her wrapped around his little finger. Thinks he can do whatever he likes when she's not around. Is there another girl? He says no, but I've seen her with him at the garage and walking in the high street. And she's still a child too. But I won't mention names. It would cost me my job. I am sure he will see the error of his ways, mademoiselle. Be patient. Huh. Au revoir, madame. Latched tight on the inside. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. The door, it is locked tight. Mrs. Castle would likely throw me out on my ear if I began rifling through her office. Well, Poirot, this will surely prove useful. I'll copy the valid information into my journal. Ah, Mr. Poirot. Good morning. All settled in, are you? Yes, Mrs. Castle. Thank you. I am looking forward to my little holiday from crime. Anything I can help you with? A most beautiful island. Where can I learn more of its history? That brochure will introduce you to the colorful past of Sea Drift Island in Leathercombe Bay. Once you've studied that, you'll probably have more questions. I'm from London myself. But most of our staff are local. Perhaps they can help you. And the villagers have all sorts of wonderful stories. Have the coastal evacuations affected you yet? As you can see from the register, our two largest parties have gone. In the past few weeks, the Smuggler's End pub here on the island has closed, and Leathercombe Bay is almost a ghost town. Every day I expect Colonel Weston to order the hotel closed as well. It's only a matter of time, I'm afraid. Who else is staying here at present? You are welcome to check the register if you wish, Mr. Poirot. Perhaps you'll find someone you know. I shall not keep you any longer, Mrs. Castle. Merci. If you need anything more, I'll be in my office.
Forgive the intrusion, mademoiselle. Oh. I did not mean to startle you. Not at all. I must have been miles away. You're Monsieur Poirot, aren't you? I understood you joined us last evening. I'm Rosamond Darnley. Enchanté. What brings you to Sea Drift Island, Mademoiselle Darnley? A short rest before the fall season. But of course. You are the proprietress of Rosemont, the fashion house. Your designs are first rate. Hastings, what does Poirot know of such things? I'm surprised you are interested in women's fashions, Monsieur Poirot. Eh? Sometimes I surprise even myself, Mademoiselle. It is very quiet here in this bar. I don't mind the quiet. There were a number of children here until a few days ago. They were evacuated. Ken's daughter Linda is here, but she's 16. Hardly a child anymore. I've had one odd incident. A small crime, even. Sometimes these small crimes are but appetizers to a main course. I brought a typewriter down to catch up on some correspondence. It disappeared from my room the day after I arrived. Have you been here on the island long? Just a few days. It was a spur of the moment sort of thing. Did you report the theft? No, my jewelry and over 20 pounds in my purse were untouched. I suspect someone simply borrowed the typewriter and will return it when they're finished with it. Rude, perhaps. Possibly not a crime at all. What day did you find the typewriter missing? The 20th. Did anyone take an interest in the typewriter when you arrived? Come to think of it, a man named Major Barry did make some comment. But I rather felt he was simply looking for an excuse to talk to me. That will do for now, madame. I say, the latest number of Motor Enthusiast Magazine, Poirot. What a stroke of luck. I've been looking out for this one. Sorry, sir, the bar won't be open till 11. I am merely making the morning constitutional, young man. What is your name? Henry, sir. What can you tell me of my fellow guests, Henry? Well, I don't want to gossip, but Arlena Stewart, the actress, is staying here. And there's a Miss Rosamond Darnley in the dining room. I understand she's a famous dressmaker or something. Are you from Leathercombe Bay? No, sir. I live in Kingsbridge. Leathercombe Bay is a bit quiet for my taste, especially now they've begun the evacuations. How long have you worked at the hotel? Three years. Don't know what I'll do when they close her down. How do you like working here, Henry? Well, it's very nice, usually. Of course, Mrs. Castle, the manager, is something of a tartar. I expect that's because she's new and wants to establish her authority. Come to think of it, Gladys hasn't been herself lately. The first floor maid. Look, I'm no gossip, but I think she's had a row with her young man, Will Jenks. I expect it's nothing, really. Everyone's a bit tense these days. I will leave you to your work, Henry. Thank you, sir. Alas, Warro never learned to tickle the ivories. Poirot! You employed that phrase correctly. I hope you are not implying Poirot's English to be anything less than perfect. Well, that is to say, 
I would never presume. It appears to be an empty bottle of the Grenadine. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the hotel to Cutter's Cove, it is 25 minutes. Hello there. Good morning, mademoiselle. I am Hercule Poirot. Emily Brewster, pleasure to meet you. You rest from your exertions? No, I teach ballet to a lot of energetic young girls. It would take more than a little row around this tiny island to wear me out. I don't know if you noticed, but I found what looks like the carving of a dart on a rock on the path there when I came down to bathe. It appears to be quite old. I was curious to see if there were any more carvings along here. And have your investigations met with success? Nothing so far. The sea may have worn any away, I suppose. Are you enjoying Sea Drift Island? To tell you the truth, Mr. Poirot, this was a necessary trip for me. I lost a very close friend several months ago. I'm here to try and come to terms with her death, and to reclaim my life if I can. Forgive me for being so frank to an innocent question. I'm not sure why I said that. Not at all, mademoiselle. People often find they can confide in me. Of course. You're that Hercule Poirot. There is more than one? I've heard of you, of course. I apologize, I didn't make the connection at once. Have you been here at the hotel long? Nine or ten days. Have you formed any impressions of our fellow guests? Are you down here on a case, Mr. Poirot? No, no. For a short holiday only. Forgive me if the question was impertinent. Oh, I don't mind. Let's see. Horace Blatt is a wealthy businessman, of the sort one tries to avoid in London. Loud and boorish. I think he finds us all rather boring. The Red Ferns seem like a nice couple, but I've noticed a tension between them. If you want my opinion, Arlena Marshall is at the bottom of it. She's one of those women men seem drawn to, and other women tend to hate. You choose to bathe here instead of at the beach? Yes, I do so every day. It's just a few steps from the hotel. And there's this one gentleman, Major Barry, who seems to take a rather obvious interest in women in bathing attire. Makes my flesh crawl. So I try to avoid the beach. Good luck in your investigation. Thank you.
Good morning, mademoiselle. May I join you? I would be delighted. It's Madame Redfern, by the way. Christine. You must be Hercule Poirot, the famous detective. I am he. Modesty, old man. You may have reason to be modest, Hastings. Poirot does not. The old place was buzzing last night when you arrived. What brings you to this smuggler's rest hotel? I'm here with my husband, Patrick. Damn! Hastings! It was his idea, really. He's the outdoors type. But I burn so easily, I'm afraid. I must take care. Ah, it is a perfect day for sketching. Yes, indeed. I'm trying to capture that sailboat down there. I see it. The man at the tiller seems quite good. That's Horace Black. He's a guest here. He splits his time mainly between the bay and the bar. A red sail is unusual, is it not? Yes, quite. Where is your husband? That's him down there, swimming. You do not swim, Madame Redfern? No. The man near the equipment shed is George, the bathing beach attendant. That other man in the chair is Major Barry. You'll find him there most days, especially if there are any women swimming. Major Barry has an eye for the ladies? Definitely. Bit of a bore, too. Full of stories about the army in India, Matt and his dogs. He apparently has many, many dogs. What can you tell me about our fellow guests? Well, there's Emily Brewster. You'll usually find her rowing about the island. Ballet instructor at a school in North Torton, I believe. There's a couple from up north somewhere. Gardeners. She'll talk your ear off. He's rather a dear, really. And... Arlena Stewart, of course. You must have heard by now that she is here. Oh, you know her? My husband does. Our time here may be cut short. Because of the evacuation, you mean? Many seaside resorts are already closed. Yes, that's mainly why I agreed to come. This could be Patrick's last chance for who knows how long. I'm afraid that's enough sum for me for a while, Mr. Poirot. It has been a pleasure, madame. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the bathing beach to Cutter's Cove via the path, it is 18 minutes. Good morning, monsieur. Capital morning, capital. You must be that detective, Johnny, who arrived last night. Major Montague Barry, late of His Majesty's Army in India. It is a pleasure, Major Barry. You are on a bathing beach, but you do not bathe, Major? No, no, never got the taste for it. The scenery can be quite pleasant, though. Yes, it is very nice. Nice? Now? Wouldn't say that. None of the finer sex about. Good-looking fillies, some of them. Where are they all, I wonder? Have you been at the hotel long? A couple of weeks. One last hurrah, you might say, before Fritz arrives on our doorstep. Yes, they are coming very soon now, I think. Bombs first, of course. Soften us up, or so they think. Not like India. I was there for the start of the Third Afghan War. Now that was war with some honor to it. In those days, you could see a man's eyes go dull as you killed him. How did you come to Sea Drift Island? I show my dogs over in Dartmouth twice a year. Train them, you see. I always told myself I'd stay here once when I got my chance. Are your dogs here? At the hotel? Not likely. They are safe at some kennels I found near Exmoor. Had to get them out of London, you see. Wouldn't have stood the bombing, poor beasts. Do you know anything of the history of this place? 
Not much. Heard some rot about Roman orgies way back when. Then some monks decided this would be a wonderful place to make brandy. There's that smuggler Tom Cutter, of course. Gave his name to a cove here on the island. Supposed to still haunt the pub. That's about it. Any impressions of our fellow guests? That actress is a fine specimen, no denying. The Red Fern Lass is not bad, but a bit too pale for my taste. I like him with a bit of colour. Miss Darnley, the dressmaker, she's quite attractive in her own way, too. Enjoy the scenery, Major Barry. I will, when it arrives. Morning, sir. I'm afraid the rowboat is out, but I could set you up with a nice rubber float. No, thank you. Warrow does not float. Oh, no worries, sir. A bit of exercise would soon help that. <laughs> yes. I see no cause for amusement. You are the beach tender? That's right, sir. I keep an eye on the equipment, look after the grounds, the tennis court, and so on as well. Do you enjoy your job? It's all right. Not much for excitement, and the new manager's ever so strict. Henry the barman, though. He's my mate. Henry makes an excellent cocktail. He makes a superb planter's punch, direct from the Caribbean it is. Are you from this area? Born and raised in Leathercombe Bay. You must know many interesting stories of the area. You mean Tom Cutter, the ghost, the treasure. <laughs> Mr. Gardner was quizzing me about old Tom just the other day. Some will tell you it's just stories, but I saw him a few weeks back, white and glistening in the moonlight like he'd risen from the sea. He was drowned? Yes, sir. Some rival done him in. You'll hear other accounts, but that's my belief. How do you know the figure you saw was a ghost? Well, he disappeared into thin air, didn't he? Where did you see him? Outside the Smuggler's End pub well after midnight. He passed inside. I'd had my share of liquid courage, so I follows him. Down into the cellar he goes, so down I go. And what do you think? He was helping himself to a tankard of grog? Grog? What is Grog Hastings? Shh. No. Vanished into thin air. Ghosts do that. How long have you worked here? Almost ten years now. But that's all coming to an end. Hmm, why is that? Got my papers, didn't I? Reporting for duty next week. Navy Frogman, that's what I'm going to be. I will leave you to your duties. A length of sturdy cord. Hastings? I swim like the dolphin. I simply do not wish to swim at the present moment. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the ledges to Cutter's Cove, it is six minutes. You wish to eavesdrop Hastings? As you wish, we will listen to their conversation. Sightseeing is all very well. I'd like to do a place thoroughly. But a quiet spot by the seaside where I can just sit and do my knitting is so relaxing, isn't it, Oakley? Yes, darling. And this is such a picturesque spot. Quite out of the world and at the same time very comfortable and most exclusive in every way, isn't it, Oakley? Yes, darling. We have heard all there is to hear. We have heard all... Bonjour, madame. Bonjour, monsieur. I hope I do not disturb you. Why, of course not. He's not disturbing us, is he, Oakley? No, darling. You must be our newest addition. Mr. Hercule Poirot, the famous detective. You recall me telling you he would be joining us, Oakley? Yes, darling. I am Mrs. Carrie Gardner. This is my husband, Oakley. Very pleased to make your acquaintances. Are you enjoying your stay on the island? Very much. 
It's so peaceful and relaxing. So far from the cares of the world, isn't it, Oakley? Yes, darling. This is an interesting spot. Yes, isn't it? Not as much wind, I think, as the terrace above the bathing beach or over at Sanctuary Cove. Oh, look, Oakley. There goes Miss Brewster again. Can't think where she gets her energy. What business are you in, Monsieur Gardner? Oakley is retired, Mr. Porro. He was manager and owner of the Lake District's best-known theatre company. These days I travel and indulge my passion for collecting rare coins. Enough of that. I'm sure Mr. Perot isn't interested in old coins. Our fellow guests seem most charming. You think so? Some are, of course. Others, well, I wouldn't like to say, but I was telling Oakley just last evening that that Stuart woman is paying quite too much attention to Mr. Redfern, wasn't I, Oakley? Of course, having run a theatre, I'm well aware that actors aren't like us. They have different standards. Lower standards? Yes, darling. And you should have seen Mr. Marshall and Miss Darnley laughing and joking yesterday. Everyone thought they'd just met. But apparently they are old friends. I will leave you now. Sturdy post. A sturdy post. What are you thinking, Hastings? Poirot, he does not climb up and down the ladders? An older ladder that has collapsed? I wonder if anyone was climbing it at the time. And this was quite a beautiful structure before it went apart. Yes, Hastings, religion cannot be faulted for its aesthetic, at least. I imagine this was. Yes, Hastings. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove, the spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the monastery ruins to Cutter's Cove, it is 12 minutes. This post looks like it was once an ore. But what is its purpose now? Curious, isn't it? It was an ore, I believe. Planted quite securely in the ground now. I can't shift it. I'm Stephen Lane. Hercule Poirot. Ah, the detective. Maybe you have a theory what it's for. Without more evidence, a deduction is difficult. Here you go, then. I, I found these near the edge of the cleared space. Chicken feathers, I believe. I think those stains are dried blood. Suggestive, don't you think? Perhaps. Do you have a theory about this post and the clearing, Monsieur Lane? I felt something the moment I arrived on this island, Mr. Poirot. It is especially strong here. I can only describe it as a feeling of evil. More than a feeling, it's almost a physical presence. Yes, it is very romantic here. It is peaceful. The sun shines, the sea it is blue. But there is evil everywhere under the sun. There's a quote from Ecclesiastes. Yea. Also, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. 
and madness is in their heart while they live. Nowadays, nobody believes in evil. Even with what is happening in Europe, they want to think that reason and common sense will prevail. But evil cannot be reasoned with, and it is real. It walks the earth. What brings you to Sea Drift Island, Monsieur Lane? My... my health. I, I am... well, I, I was the vicar of a church near Brixham. I became ill. I had to leave my church. I came here to heal among the historic churches and religious ruins of the area, like this old monastery. It dates back to the Middle Ages. The order was most known for producing a passable brandy, I believe, but they never flourished. I expect that was because of the site they chose. What is wrong with this site? It isn't the only Christian edifice erected on top of more ancient construction, as I'm sure you know. In this case, there was a Roman temple here, 500 years before the monks arrived. Unfortunately, it is believed it was a temple to Bacchus, a particularly nasty cult notable for debauchery and licentiousness. Bacchus, eh? That might explain the decent brandy. I was searching for evidence of the earlier temple when you arrived. I found an opening beneath one of the walls over there, leading down into the earth. But it's blocked by a sizable stone. I was hoping to use this post as a lever, but, but it's immovable. What do you think of our fellow guests? I haven't spent much time with them, I'm afraid. I've been poking around out here, mainly. If I could get some idea of the location of other nearby religious sites, I, I expect I'd be off to visit those. I think it would do me good after this place. Mr. Poirot, I'm feeling under the weather. These ruins take it quite out of me, I'm afraid. If you'll excuse me. But of course. No, Hastings. This stage has been carefully prepared. We will not disarrange it until we know why and by whom. There is quite a passage down there. We will need something more than good intentions to shift this stone, however. I say, that looks like one of those doors you find in old monasteries. What do you call them? A monk's door, Hastings. Tightly locked. And the door may be ancient, but that keyhole looks as if it had been recently used. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From Sanctuary Cove to Cutter's Cove, it is 15 minutes. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Hello. I am Hercule Poirot. A fellow guest who has arrived only last night. I'm Linda, Marshall. I'm here with my father and his wife. What about the pile of brush interests you so? It is just a pile of brush, isn't it? You wish it were something else? I was trying to make a blind so the Gilmores would come closer. A hunter's blind? I don't want to hunt them. They're wonderful creatures. I just want to study them. I would offer my assistance, but Poirot knows nothing of blinds, I am afraid. Wait, Poirot. That won't do. 
Did you make a blind for the girl, or didn't you? That is to say, I might be able to construct one? You just didn't want to admit you'd done any physical labor. You know nothing about them, but you can build one. Yes. Is it not strange how we can feel such contradictory notions sometimes? Oh, those? I have them all the time. I'm a mass of contradictions. Gimos? The birds? Yes. Do you know about them? I cannot say I do. Hold on, Poirot. I do. I let the child speak, Hastings. Oh. Oh, rather. They are really quite common. These are of the genus Urea algae. They live in great colonies. They look almost like penguins, don't they? They waddle along and bow to one another. And sometimes they purr, almost like kittens. Good heavens, Poirot. I never thought of it before, but do you know who they remind me of? They are truly marvelous. They seem to like it here very much. The government made it a sanctuary for them. That's what this place is called now. Sanctuary Cove. What brings you to this smuggler's rest hotel? It was Arlena's idea. That's my stepmother. Are you enjoying yourself? No, I hate it. I don't know why we're here. Ah well, this summer it is almost past. I think your school it will be starting again soon? Miss Porter's? I suppose so. I wouldn't know. Miss Porter's? Hastings. The name of this school is familiar to me. There is a newspaper account in my files. What do you think of your fellow guests? Miss Darnley's nice and Christine Redfern is too. But I hate her husband. He is unkind to you? No, it's my father I care about. He can't see it, but I can. I see what's happening. It has been a pleasure, mademoiselle. Can you really make a blind? I'm no good at it at all. I... I will try. Thank you. Hey, Stings, what have you gotten me into now? Relax, old man. All we really need is some cord, a couple of sturdy posts, and something to anchor it all with. Tent stakes, for example. Tent stakes? On an island with a perfectly good hotel. Why would anyone need tent stakes? Oh, well, I see your point. Now let me handle this, Poirot. As you wish. Not a bad blind, if I do say so myself. Not a bad blind, if I do say so myself. Hello! You haven't seen a tennis ball in the grass, have you? I had a lob go spectacularly astray. No, monsieur. I am sorry. You wouldn't be Hercule Poirot by any chance, would you? I am Poirot, monsieur. Kenneth Marshall. That was my wife, Arlena. She is very charming, Madame Marshall. Hastings, if you embarrass me, we will cease the investigation at once. My apologies, Poirot. I'll try to remember who I am. Listen, Poirot. 
This is a bit of luck finding you here. Something rather distressing has happened. Since our arrival here on Monday, Arlena has received two, what I can only describe as threatening notes. Do you have the notes? Well, yes, here they are. Arlena thinks I destroyed them, but I thought I'd better not. Very wise. One moment, please, while I examine them. Arlena refuses to take them seriously. She says people are often jealous of her due to her success and uh, her beauty, and it's no more than that. I'm not so sure. You are right to be concerned. In my experience, Captain Marshall, the hatred to write such notes is one to take very seriously indeed. Would you have a talk with Arlena and tell her that? I will do as you ask. How did these arrive? The first was simply shoved under her door. The second was found on her dressing table. Mr. Poirot, her door was locked. When did Mrs. Marshall receive these? That first note was found the morning after we arrived. That would have been August 20th. The second appeared yesterday. Knowing you are investigating has eased my mind enormously. Captain Marshall, I will do what I can to assist you. But if I am to be successful, I must enjoy your wife's complete cooperation. I hope you can succeed in convincing her of the gravity of the situation. If you'll excuse me, I have some letters to type. He has... Some letters to type? He seems unaware of the significance of what he has said. How many typewriters can there be on this island? Seems more likely Miss Darnley's typewriter was borrowed to write the notes. It is possible. You knew there might be a real danger to Mrs. Marshall even then. Yes, my friend. I could feel something in the wind. The way sailors can sense the approaching storm. Bit of a low spot in the near ad service court. It is an unusual wreck for a garden, that. It's to keep the clay of the court smooth. And from the look of that clay, it's about time for a good rake. I did not mean to frighten you, my friend. You didn't, and I'm not. The pub, it is open? No. You have the binoculars, I see. What of it? They are for the watching of birds? Yes, I'm very fond of birds. Are you staying at the hotel? Are you? May we. Hercule Poirot, at your service. My name is North. If he's a bird watcher, I'm... I'm a penguin, Poirot. Shall we follow him? It is up to you. He's up to something, Poirot. Are you going to let him get away? My shoes are of their finest leather, buff to a perfect sheen. I will not be subjecting them to seawater. Take them off, then. If you wish to cross the causeway, summon the sea tractor. I will not wait. Oh, for pity's sake. <coughs> Phone isn't much good if no one will answer it.
Waro will not be waiting in this story. That must be clear. Latched tight on the inside. It's thirsty work, but you'd best leave me to it. <laughs> Patrick, darling, you're such a child. Mad enough. I see what you mean, old man. There is indeed a storm coming. There is nothing further to be found here. There is nothing... I swim like the dolphin. I simply do not wish to swim at the present moment. We cannot search the office when its owner stands before us? Was there something else, Mr. Poirot? Is the hotel safe at the disposal of guests? Of course. We'll be happy to store any of your valuables. Have you been the manager here long? Only a few months. Not quite the situation I was hoping for. And it won't last much longer thanks to the war. Are there any golf courses nearby on the mainland? Hastings, Poirot does not play their golf. Remember where, who you are. Sorry, old man. I will not impose upon you further, madame. Mr. Poirot, there was one thing. Oui, madame? It's such a small matter, I feel silly bringing it to the attention of a gentleman with your reputation. Do not let the reputation of Poirot cause you to hesitate in your inquiry. Well, my wire recorder has gone missing. I used to dictate all my letters for a girl in the village to type up. She's learning to type, so she brings her own typewriter. I need only supply the paper. When was the wire recorder taken? Sometime on the evening of the 19th. Do you lock your office? There has never been any need. I lock the safe, of course. That is where all the valuables are kept. Did anything else out of the ordinary happen on the day the recorder went missing? Let me see. Well, that was the day Arlena Stewart arrived. A celebrity such as she causes quite a stir. I am not sure what I can do, but I will be happy to keep my eyes and ears open, madame. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poirot. A wire recorder? Those things are huge. Shouldn't be difficult to track down. Pardon, madame? Eh bien, Hastings. You have made good progress. 
The principles of the cast have made their entrances. You have explored as much as was possible to me on the morning of August 24th. You have uncovered some of the mysteries that made me uneasy, even then. Did you already know murder was in the wind? It was very clearly indicated, mon cher. Why didn't you stop it? If a person is determined to commit murder, it is not easy to prevent them. I do not blame myself for what happened. It was inevitable. What are my next steps? When you are ready, we will continue our little game. I was able to explore further. Introduce yourself to the residents of Leathercombe Bay. Look for opportunities to assist anyone you can in the village or on the island. They will appreciate your thoughtfulness and will be more likely to help you when you need a favor in return. As before, if you find yourself unable to progress, I will assist with the magic of the Finger of Suspicion. Yes, uncanny, that gadget. I believe you promised me a second clue to unravel its mysteries? Quite right, my friend. The clue is... Lamp. Power. Lamp. Illuminating. I didn't think you were here, sir. Your towels are fresh and your bed linen changed, so never you mind about that. Good grief. That girl certainly got the wind up over something. The boyfriend, Will Jinx, I suspect is their cause. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. It is quite a view, Hastings, but I fear my eyesight is not up to the task of making out any items of interest unaided. Do you observe anything unusual, Madame Kessel? Not yet, I'm thankful to say. Mr. Blatt's sailboat put into Leathercombe Bay a short while ago. I suspect he'll make for the Monkshood before heading back out. What do you look for so intently, Madame Kessel? U boats, Mr. Poirot. I have seen them, too. So close to shore? Oh, yes. I suspect there's one out there right now, watching. Have you told this to Monsieur Blatt? Yes, I did. He laughed at me and said they were not likely to waste a torpedo on his tiny sailboat. He has their point there. What is the monk's hood? The only pub still open between here and Kingsbridge. Albert Bagley runs it. Who has the key to the smuggler's end? Colonel Weston took charge of it when they closed up. Colonel Weston? But he is an old friend of mine. He's set up shop in the police station. But is he not the chief constable for the entire district? Yes, but he runs the home guard for this area. He's overseeing the coastal evacuations. We used to have a local constable, but after evacuations got underway, he was transferred to Modbury. May I borrow your binoculars? I need them, Mr. Poirot. I promised Colonel Weston I'd keep watch. Surely no attack will come during the afternoon. Why do you want binoculars? 
to observe the guillemot at the sanctuary of the birds? You don't strike me as the bird-watching type, Mr. Poirot. It is odd that you say that, madame. I thought the same of a gentleman I met this morning. What gentleman? He called himself Mr. North. Is he perhaps a guest? No, I've never heard of him. To help in the watch for u boats Well, I do have other duties to attend to. I mark any sightings on the calendar in my office. If you would do the same, I then pass on the information to Colonel Weston. But of course. And if you wouldn't mind doing me one small personal favor. I would be happy to assist you, madame. If you would return this book to the lending library, I'd think that a very fair trade. I shall do as you ask. Here you are, then. I'll be off. The good detective knows even the most useful tools have their proper time and place. These are the binoculars, most splendid, but I cannot see anything of particular interest here. These are the binoculars. These are the binoculars, most splendid, but I cannot see anything of particular interest here. Good afternoon, Madame Gardner. Hello, Mr. Poirot. May I join you? I should like the company. Thank you. That is a very beautiful shawl. Oh, thank you. It seems as I've been working on it for ages. You enjoy the knitting? Oh, yes. Oakley has his coins. I have this. There. Finished. Oh, you are very skilled. Monsieur Gardiner seems young to be already retired. Oh, well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Poirot, retirement chose Oakley. He did not choose it. A financial misfortune? Yes. You recall his mentioning the theatre he used to manage? Bien, sir. He was the owner as well. The theatre had not been doing well. Oakley hit on the idea of paying a great deal of money, more than he could afford to lose, to attract a major star to perform there. She took the money and claimed illness. The show was cancelled. There was nothing for it but to close. We live off his army pension and a bit half put away. What brought you to Seadrift Island, Madame Gardner? Hmm. Oh, my God. Goodness! What is it? Our anniversary is today. 
Our 29th anniversary and I had forgotten it. Oh, I have nothing to give him. Perhaps that's sure. I have often found them of great value fending off the cold of a winter evening. Orkley wouldn't be caught dead in a shawl. And I have no time to knitting anything else. I see. Oh, Mr. Poirot, I know he'd give me my present at dinner. What shall I do? Allow Poirot to assist you. I will find a suitable gift. If you could do that, this shawl is yours. I'd better get back to the hotel. I want to be ready for dinner. Poirot, there is too much going on to bother ourselves with this. Au contraire, my friend. It does not hurt to help others in need, and that is a shawl I would prize. Did you know that woman was going to be here? Look, Christine. I don't know what's come over you. Over me? Oh, Patrick. You insisted so on coming here. You knew Mrs. Marsh was going to be here. You're infatuated with her. For God's sake, Christine, don't make a fool of yourself. We've been so happy. We are happy. But we shan't go on being happy if I can't even speak to another woman without you kicking up a row. You're in love with her. Don't be ridiculous. Come on. Let's go back to the hotel. I'm climbing down to Cutter's Cove. You can come if you like. This isn't good. No, my friend. Yet there is nothing we can do. Events will take their course. What do you think you're playing at? Poirot, he goes for the afternoon constitutional. Nothing more. Poirot, you say? The detective? The very same. I'm Patrick Redfern. My wife, Christine, and I. You down here on the case? No, no. Merely the holiday. Oh, you are on holiday as well? That's right. I'm an estate agent. War is hard on the housing market. So, we took a few days off. War is hard on many things. That's true enough. How do you like Sea Drift Island? I think it's grand, actually. The weather has been cooperating and the swimming is first rate. I used to spend most of my time as a boy exploring this coast long before there was a hotel here. I observed earlier you enjoy their friendship with Elena Marshall. Oh, she's just an acquaintance Christine and I made up in London. Quite the coincidence, all of you turning up here. Yes, rather. What was it like here when you were a boy? Just the smugglers and pub all shut up here on the island and Cutter's Cave, of course. Cutter's Cave? It's behind some rocks down in Cutter's Cove there. You haven't explored it? Ah, uh, no. The ladder? It is safe? The metal one sounds enough. You can also row around from the bathing beach if you like. Ah, and Mrs. Redfern, does she share your enthusiasm? Yes, she's enjoying her sketching immensely. She's quite good at it too. If you'll excuse me, Mr. Poirot, I'm going to wait on the deck for my wife. Blind? The birds practically walk right up to me. I am pleased you find it adequate, Mademoiselle Marshall. But there's something wrong. Look at that one on the rock nearest the shore. What is on it, Mr. Poirot? It looks like oil, Poirot. Maybe from a leaky boat engine. It'll kill the bird, I'm afraid. Mademoiselle, it is oil, I fear. Very bad for living things. Oh, please, please, Mr. Poirot. We must try to save it. Hastings? I am out of my depth here. I'm afraid I am too, old man. Maybe there's someone in the village who could help us? The bird is close enough you could trap the bird with a fishnet without getting your feet wet. 
we do not have the fish net. No more can be learned by disturbing her any further at the moment. Bonjour, Monsieur Gardner. Have you lost something? What? Oh, hello, Mr. Poirot. Lost something? Uh, no, no. Just looking at the grass. You look at the grass with great intensity. Nothing wrong in that, I hope. My hobby could be gardening, like my name. It could be. That is true. But you have already told me your hobby is collecting rare coins. I did, did I? Well, it's true. A wonderful view from this spot. Yes, I'm told Tom Cutter spent long hours up here watching the sea for ships that might run aground. What brings you and the charming Mrs. Gardner to Seadrift Island? Whim, I think. I don't quite recollect. No, that's not it. Oh, my God. What is it? Why did we come here? We came here... Good God, man. Today is our anniversary. August 24th, 29th anniversary. Now you've completely forgotten. What am I going to do? If I try to sneak into time, she'll know. She'll know I forgot. Do not concern yourself, my friend. I, Hercule Poirot, will undertake this mission for you. And Mrs. Gardner will be none the wiser. That's very decent of you, Mr. Poirot. What can I do in return? Just repaying you doesn't seem enough. Huh? Possibly tell me the truth about why you came to Seadrift Island. I expect you've already guessed, but if you can find Kerry a present, I'll be happy to share all I know. Eh bien, no time must be lost. What shall I purchase for her? Why, well, I, I don't know. Use your own discretion. I know frilly undergarments, though. That wouldn't do. I need to alert the cook. I want a little cake and champagne. If I say something to you that is probably outrageously impertinent, will you never speak to me again? I don't think I'd ever regard anything you say to me as impertinent. Why don't you divorce Arlena? She's pretty notorious. You don't understand, my dear girl. Are you so frightfully fond of her? It's not a question of that. Arlena's not good for Linda, nor for you. Perhaps. But you see, I gave my word. Marriage is a vow, Rosa. I'm sick of quick marriage and easy divorce. Arlena's my wife. That's all there is to it. Till death do you part? Yes. Till death do us part. I see. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the tennis court to Cutter's Cove, it is 20 minutes.
boat varnish. Poirot, open the lid. If I get any of this boat varnish on my clothes, you will pay the cleaning bills? Alas, it is stuck fast. I cannot open it. I will take the float hastings, but do not expect Poirot to paddle around the sea on it. I swim like the dolphin. I simply do not wish to swim at the present moment. It is quite a view, Hastings. But I fear my eyesight is not up to the task of making out any items of interest unaided. There is something snagged by the swimming float. I wonder what it could be. Lifering away by the look of it. I wonder if a ship has come to harm. I know there's no use asking if you have a quick swim out there, though. I am happy you realize that, my friend. I did not mean to frighten you, Major Barry. What? Frighten me? A man with 20 years of service to Her Majesty on the frontier? Rubbish! That fellow is up to something, Poirot. Mark my words. Something, or someone, had certainly captured his interest. Madame Marshall? Oh, this island is too small. There is nowhere to hide. If you wish it, I will withdraw. No, never mind. The famous detective, I believe. I am at your service, Madame. Are you indeed? That's uncommonly good of you. I understand Kenneth told you about the notes I've received. I think you should take these notes seriously, Madame. You may be right. You have had the change of heart, then? You could say that. In order to help you, I must ask of you some questions. Impertinent questions, I should think. Necessary questions. Very well, then. Was it Mr. Marshall who made you decide to speak with me? Kenneth? No, of course not. What was it, then? I've received another threat. Here it is. The day of your punishment is at hand. It sounds rather like things are coming to a head, doesn't it? I would say so, yes. Do you know of anyone who might wish you harm? I'm rich, beautiful, and famous. There's a certain delight in those who are not rich, or beautiful, or famous, when someone like me makes a misstep or suffers some tragedy. The newspapers and film magazines thrive on stories of the high and mighty brought low. All that you say may be true. Yet these notes do not sound as if they were written from jealousy. The underlying emotion feels to me different. Hatred? Exact. It's no secret I get on with men, Monsieur Poirot. I like men. Men like me. Not so the women. If I were to suspect anyone, it would be a woman who believed I had wronged her in some way. A name would be helpful. Possibly. But that is all I'm going to say. Has anyone here on the island aroused your suspicions? No, not a soul. This surprises me. I thought actors were keen observers of their human nature. Do not confuse lack of observation with lack of interest, Monsieur Praro. Is there nothing you can tell me that would assist me in helping you? Tell me this. Are you certain the notes mean my life is in danger? No, madame, I am not. Oh, come now, Poirot. Isn't it obvious? No, Hastings. Nothing is obvious. I agree with you. 
good day. A Bible, Poirot. Not so unlikely a thing to find in the room of a former clergyman? Revelation 2.20 Thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now why would he have that particular passage open? If I remember correctly, this must be Stephen Lane's room. No markings on the bottle at all. I will take only two. Perhaps we can determine what they are. Mineral oil makes a spiffing laxative. We will borrow the mineral oil hastings, but Poirot has no need of their laxative. No, no. The door, it will not budge. From the looks of these betting receipts, 
The Major is his bookmaker's best and unluckiest customer. I think this room belongs to Major Barry. One of those straps on the suitcase might come in handy. Let us hope the Major is not as observant as Poirot. I believe we've damaged Major Barry's suitcase sufficiently, Hastings. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. Latched tight on the inside. The door, it is locked tight. No, no. The door, it will not budge. Latched tight on the inside. The door, it is locked tight. Oh, please come back later. I'm dressing for dinner. No, no. The door, it will not budge. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. Latched tight on the inside. No, no. The door, it will not budge. The door, it is locked tight. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. The door is locked, but I can hear the voices from within. Perhaps we should listen a bit closer, Hastings. You had no right to tell that silly little man about the notes. If you can't take them seriously, someone must. I rather thought you might have written them. Me? Why on earth? If you thought I'd been misbehaving again. Do you think I can't see why you dragged us down here for a holiday? Somebody told me about this place. I think it was the Rylands. Look here, Arlena. I know what you're like. That boy is fond of his wife, really. Must you upset the whole blinking show? Kenneth, don't let Patrick upset you so. He's a puppy. Nothing more. So you admit that young Redfern is crazy about you? It's really rather stupid of him. You know, don't you, Ken? That I don't really care for anyone but you. I think I know you pretty well, Arlena. The door, it is locked tight.
A bust of somebody named Tom Cutter. Never heard of him. The felt on the bottom appears to be loose. Fascinating. A plate with a keyhole in it. A plate with a keyhole in it. Another key. One could hardly call this bust a bust at all. Wouldn't you say, Poirot? Ah, a welcome appearance by the most elusive rarity, the wit of the British. Right. No need for barbs, old man. A solidly built safe that needs a key to open it. The safe, it opened effortlessly. It must see frequent use. Good God, Poirot. That's a German two-way radio. I think we'd better have a talk with that castle woman. No, make a note of the codes. But we must not remove anything or mention our discovery, Hastings. I agree something is not right, but let us rest and see what occurs with her. These codes aren't standard Morse. I don't like the look of them at all. A common enough oil lantern used for signaling. We will leave it for the present, Hastings. It will not budge. Hello? Need the sea tractor, do you? Yes, please. On me way. Not so much to do in Leathercombe Bay now that the evacuation's begun. Most places have closed up except the chemists. Mrs. Hughes has to stay because she's the post office too. And lending library if it comes to that. But it's the post that must be seen too. Now that the smuggler's end is closed, the only pub is the Monk's Hood. Mr. Bagby is trying to stay open as long as he can. Once the hotel is closed, there won't be much trade for him. Ready to head back to the island, Mr. Poirot? Not quite yet. I know we haven't been properly introduced, but I'm Will Jenks, and I've heard you're a famous detective. I am the detective, it is true. But famous? No. That is something of an exaggeration. Steady on, old boy. Bah! Hastings, you caution me against braggadocio, so I display modesty, and still you find fault. It's my young lady, Gladys. Maybe you've seen her at the smuggler's rest? Bien, you are a lucky young man. I do know that, Mr. Poirot. Not many girls in these parts can hold a candle to my Gladys. 
but lately she's been very distant to me. She is of the opinion that you are seeing someone else. But that's nonsense. Someone she called only the slip of a girl? But who... She means that Marshall girl what arrived a few days ago. She's been following me about ever since I first took him across on the sea tractor. Have you encouraged Madame Marshall? I should hope not. But she's just a kid. She'd be in school if she wasn't tossed out of that posh girl's school of hers. In some ways, yes. Perhaps she is, as you say, still the kid. In others, who can tell? Where has she followed you? She'll call for the sea tractor. I'll bring her across. Then she'll want to go right back to the island again. Then she's always hanging about the garage here. I think she may be a thief too. What makes you say that? Well, my shovel's gone missing, hasn't it? And I first noticed it were gone right after one of her visits here. You believe me, don't you, Mr. Poirot? Yes, but it is not important that I believe you. It is Gladys who must believe. I'll wring that Linda Marshall's neck for her. I will have the talk with Mademoiselle Marshall. In the meantime, there will be no wringing of the necks. Promise me. I promise. Poirot does not drive the motor cars, Hastings? It isn't fair. I should be able to go for a spin, if only to clear the cobwebs from my brain. In the interest of friendship, I will not comment about the cobwebs. Hands off me tools. Hands off me tools. Hands off me tools. The cars, they do not belong to Poirot. Poirot will leave them be. I should be able to drive wherever I like. Hello. Who is this, please? Not much can be done with that old skiff. They think it is falling to pieces. Useful fellow. Repairs both motor cars and boats. The village is practically abandoned. Yes? Did I keep you waiting? I'm afraid I'm not myself today. I'm ever so distracted trying to solve this mystery. A mystery? Sounds promising. What is the nature of your mystery, madame? Several letters have gone missing over the past few days. I can't understand it. I'm terribly conscientious with the post, I promise you. Someone must be stealing them. Were the letters valuable? No. They were important to my customers who were expecting them, perhaps, but none contained money or anything like that. Still, my customers are complaining and I'm at a loss to explain it. You can borrow that if you like. I'm sorry, sir. You mustn't touch that. I use the test tubes to test for chemicals and to make up the various solutions and powders I dispense by prescription, and the microscope to look for impurities. It is a shame not to have access to the equipment tastings. It would be handy to be able to test various substances you come across in your investigation. You can just take that. No charge. We have no need to send the telegram, Hastings. Madame, what is the name of this creature? That's my Chloe. Isn't she a cutie, Kins? Delightful. How may I be of service, sir? I would like to send a telegram. Of course, sir. 
Please just fill out one of those forms on the counter. Let's see. That will be five pence, if you please, sir. Thank you for your business, sir. May I help you, sir? I am returning a book for Mrs. Kasser. Oh, Love's Captive by Mrs. Arabella Richardson. I've read that one. It's a classic. How anyone can call that rot a classic is beyond me. I agree, Hastings, but we should not judge. You're right, of course, old man. Not everyone can appreciate true classics like Rough Shooting or By Motor Across Asia. Do you have any books suitable as an anniversary present for a wife? To purchase, you mean, sir? Not many. Let me see. Tell me about your wife, sir. Are you interested in spicing up your relationship a tittle? No. No spices needed. Lady Chatterley's lover is right out then. What else? Is she fond of murder, sir? I should hope not. Too bad. Murder's very popular. Lucky for you, Poirot. Shouldn't like to see you out of a job. Keep searching, if you please. I don't suppose she knits. But of course she knits. Very much she knits. Here's a brand new book we just got in. Easy French Knitting Patterns by Eugenie Blottieri. One and six, please. Hmm? One pound six shillings? Color illustrations cost a bit more. I need more money, Hastings. Wire your bank. Madame, I find myself short of the required funds. I need to wire my bank. Of course, sir. Just step over to the post office, if you please. How may I be of service, sir? I would like to send a telegram. Of course, sir. Please just fill out one of those forms on the counter. Thank you, sir. I'll send it off at once. Are there any telegrams for me? I'll just check. Sorry, sir. Nothing at the moment. The door? It is boarded up. They must have evacuated some time ago. Look at the size of that brute. <coughs> Like to try your hand at a game of darts? No merci. Maybe later then. Perhaps. Does that formidable dog belong to you? Yes, that's Baskerville. I've had him since he was a small, well, 
He was never that small. Not many customers today. What could you expect? Most of the town has been evacuated. And very few tourists turn up these days. You enjoy the playing of the darts? Ah, uh, darts is my game, right enough. It's been a tradition in these parts for centuries. Did you know the famous smuggler Tom Cutter was an expert dartsman? No, I did not. Struth. He played at the smuggler's end almost every night when he wasn't out at sea. A masterful player was old Tom. They say he scored more ton 80s than anyone before or since. Ton 80s, Hastings? The highest possible score in a single throw, Poirot. Three darts, all inside the inner narrow ring of the 20 wedge. I trust Baskerville is the excellent watchdog? Oh, hey, hey, hey. We have never had any trouble in here since Baskerville's come of age. Can't train him to do anything, of course. But with Baskerville, growling works a treat. Has Baskerville ever bitten anyone? Well, it doesn't need to, does he? All he has to do is growl. Have you ever seen Tom Cutter's ghost? No, but I've heard of them that has. If I was lucky enough to meet up with a ghost, I'd challenge him to a game of darts. And how did he die? He was hanged by the excise men from the smuggler's ensign. It's said he walks again every year on the anniversary of his death. And on what day did he die? August 24th. That's right. Tonight is the anniversary of Tom Cutter's murder. Monsieur Cutter lived at the smuggler's end? Hey, it was the only lodging on the island until the hotel was built a few years ago. Do you know anything of Tom Cutter's treasure? A lot of folk have looked high and low for the treasure, but no one's found so much as a farthing in all these years. Thank you for the conversation, my friend. Stop in any time. Maybe we can have a darts match. Bonjour, Colonel Weston. Poirot, my old friend. What brings you to Leathercombe Bay? A short trip to the seaside to replenish their little grey cells. You stopping at the smuggler's rest? <laughs> Damn shame, old man. I expect to get orders to close up the hotel any day now. This is one of the last coastal areas to be evacuated. You're in charge of the home guard? Yes, I've set up camp in the Leathercombe Bay Police Station now that their constables left for Modbury to help there. Dangerous times, Colonel. Indeed. I have spotters up and down the stretch of coastline. We've had several sightings of U-boats quite close to shore this month alone. Mon Dieu! When? Let's see. August 5th, the 13th, the 16th, and again just last night, the 23rd. Poirot, those dates don't match at all with Mrs. Castle's calendar. It is true what you say, Hastings. Have you noticed any suspicious characters about? Any stranger is suspicious these days. Did you have someone specifically in mind? I came upon a man who called himself North. He seemed to be trying to gain entry to the Smuggler's End pub. I have the only key. If he's that thirsty, he'll have to come over here to the mainland or break in. I'll keep a lookout for him. If you could get me a picture, I could send it off to Scotland Yard and see if they can come up with anything. May I borrow the key to the Smuggler's End? I would like to see if I can discover what interests him. Be my guest. Regular law enforcement stretch pretty thin these days. Is that your stethoscope? Belongs to Dr. Neesden, a local coroner. He left it here last night. I was going to return it to him. Say, that would work a treat if we wanted to listen at doors. Hmm, may I borrow it? Practicing medicine without a license, Poirot. It may be useful. One never knows. You're welcome to it. I'm sure Neesden has others. Do you have the file of the Millie Parsons murder case? Yes. At my office in Kingsbridge. A bad business. I'll have it set over this afternoon. 
Many thanks, Colonel. All right, Poirot. We've known each other a good many years. You need a stethoscope and the key to the pub? You'll forgive my saying so, but this sounds like a busman's holiday to me. If you are on to something, don't you think you'd better share? My friend, I have only the suspicions. But yes, I think there may be some cloud hanging over Sea Drift Island. A number of items have gone missing. There is tension in the air. It was never my intention to take on the case here. But now, my visit may have become what you say. The busman's holiday. Well, let me know if you uncover any serious evidence of a crime. I'll be here in Leathercombe Bay tomorrow if you need me. Many thanks, my friend. I'm off now, over to Kingsbridge for a district guard meeting. Farewell. Fancy a short game, sir? Three throws each? I will try my luck. Oh, I pegged you for a sporting gentleman the moment you first walked in here. We each start with 301 points. I don't have time for a complete game, I'm afraid. Whoever hits the highest score subtracts that from 301. We'll declare him the winner. Go on, you go first. Bad luck, Poirot. Fancy a short game, sir? Three throws each? No, merci. Oh, as you like. Maybe later. Bonjour, monsieur. Hello, a new face. Join me, sir. Blatt's the name. Horace Blatt. Hercule Poirot. Hairdresser, are ya? I beg your pardon? Oh, I don't know. Something about your manner. I am not a dresser of hairs. I am a detective. Uh, a detective? Oui, it is true. I arrived only last night. You are the avid seller, Monsieur Blatt. Used to sell quite a bit as a boy. Not this part of the world. Off the East Coast. I could have a first-rate yacht if I liked, but somehow I don't really fancy it. Much rather muck about in that little yawl of mine. You would rather do the selling yourself, perhaps? Rather than a crew? Got it in one, Monsieur Poirot. I like being in control, I suppose. Feeling the boat respond as I put her through her courses. Same with business, too, come to think of it. Made me what I am today. You've heard of Blatt's hardware, I'm sure. I may have. Biggest concern of its kind in London. It is not often one sees this sailboat with a red sail. Oh, I like a bit of change. No harm in it, I suppose. None at all. What brings you to Sea Drift Island? Don't really know why I came here. I suppose it sounded romantic. Smuggler's Rest makes you think of when you were a boy. Pirates, smuggling, all that. What do you think of our fellow guests? Mostly a dried up lot of sticks if you ask me. That Mrs. Marshall. She's the only lively one in the place. I should think Marshall's got his hands full with her. Oh, Redfern's all right too, I guess. He's been out once or twice with me in my yawl. Can't get hold of him now, always hanging about Mrs. Marshall, afraid I have to run over to Kingsbridge. You would sail no more this afternoon? I think not. Saw a bank of fog sitting off the coast when I was out before. Expect it will roll in before evening. Wouldn't want to get caught in it along this coast. Good day to you, Monsieur Poirot. Now why should the fact that your detective get his wind up? Poirot! Hairdresser? Quite securely locked, I am afraid.
like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. I've been looking after the hotel garage and driving the sea tractor for almost five years now. Motor cars are my passion. I keep the guests' motors clean and full of petrol. I also tend to any repairs they might need as well. Just look at that Major Barry's motor now. The 1938 Triumph Dolomite. It's a beautiful piece of British style and manufacturing. I can't think but what the war effort will take all the great designers to work on tanks and whatnot. Quite securely locked, I am afraid. Ah, perfection. That dartboard looks centuries old. I say, Poirot, see the carved letters? Two N's and an E. What have we here, Hastings? What have we here, Hastings? Pardon, Hastings, but... Tractor, do you? Yes, please. On me way. This sea tractor is a rare contraption, isn't it? When the smugglers' rest was first built, they used to ferry folks over by boat. But the current across the causeway here can be powerful at times. When they updated the hotel in 1932, I think it was, they had the tractor built. High tide, low tide, strong current or no. The tractor she just plows along, keeping us high and dry. It's a miracle of modern engineering, I call it. Are there any telegrams for me? I'll just check. May I help you, sir? Do you have any books suitable as an anniversary present for a wife? Here's a brand new book we just got in. Easy French Knitting Patterns by Eugenie Blottieri. One and six, please. Au revoir, madame.
like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. If you're looking for entertainment during your stay, there's not much in Leathercombe Bay or at the hotel these days. My Gladys and I usually go into Kingsbridge to the moving pictures, and there's some dancing at the hotel there still. Although, when I asked Gladys for this weekend, she refused and gave no reason, no matter how much I asked. She just said I should know. I don't understand women. I truly don't. Monsieur Gardner, do you think your wife would like this book? Easy French knitting patterns. Poirot, you're a genius. Is something snagged by their swimming float. I wonder what it could be. Lifering boy by the look of it. I wonder if a ship has come to harm. I know there's no use asking if you'd have a quick swim out there to have a look. I am happy you've realized that. Monsieur Redfern, Poirot is not the swimmer like you. I noticed something caught on the swimming float. It may cause an injury to someone. Would you retrieve it? I'd be happy to help you, but the strap on my swimming goggles is broken. As much as I like swimming, I can't go into the salt water without my goggles. Perhaps I can repair them for you. There you go. I'll be here most of the afternoon, I expect, if you manage to fix them. Your ingenuity is remarkable. Well, that is not going to help. Yes? Mr. Porro, you fixed my goggles. That's part of the strap from a suitcase, isn't it? How clever. Let's see what has been snagged on the swimming float. Beastly hot. I'll enjoy the dip. Redfern's fixed his goggles, has he? Yes. Are, Mr. Poro. It's a life ring boy. I can't see it getting torn about that way by simply catching on the swimming board. Torn? Rubbish! Poirot, those look like bullet holes. So, oh, you've got your goggles in hand, Frank. Yes, Major. Mr. Poro ingeniously cut up a luggage strap to replace the broken one. Luggage strap? Why, so it is. In fact, if I didn't know better, Thank you for the assistance, Monsieur Redfern. Good day, gentlemen.
There is quite a passage down there. We will need something more than good intentions to shift this stone, however. You continue to impress me, Hastings. From the looks of this tunnel, no one's been down here in a long time. The dust on the floor is undisturbed. A Roman column dating to the first century. Roman to be sure. Just think of the history these stones have seen, Hastings. By Jove, a gold coin in top condition! May not my friend Hastings? I could blunder about in these tunnels for hours, while who knows what crimes are committed in my absence. I need some means to ensure I am traveling in the proper direction. Mr. Poirot, did you find something Oakley would like as an anniversary present? I believe I have, my lamb. This gold coin should interest him, don't you think? Oh, this is perfect. Wherever did you find it? That must remain my secret for now. It is your shawl, Mr. Poirot, and thank you. Try again, Poirot. It's easy. Do I look like the fisherman to you, Hastings? You've done it! Only a first step, mademoiselle. Take the bird to my bath and wait for me there. Come along, you poor little thing.
Monsieur Poirot, we need to clean the glowing moors quickly. I don't think it will last much longer. Hastings, we cannot be hasty. We must find instruction on how to proceed. do you? Yes, please. On me way. I expect you've heard about our ghost, the smuggler Tom Cutter. He used to bring in his goods to the cove on Sea Drift Island they now call Cutter's Cove. And he was regular at the pub on the island. That's where he met his end, they say, hung by agents of the Crown. There'll be those who say he was shot or drowned. But my old gaffer knew the story. And he swore they strung over Tom up from the hotel side. May I help you, sir? Do you have any books on the caring for their wild birds? I know we have a book on local birds somewhere. Let me see. Oh, here it is. Birding on Devon's Shores by Major Marcus Touchberry. And yes, here's a chapter describing some treatments for various afflictions. Oh, dear. What is it? Most of the time the author says to just shoot them. There's another chapter of recipes. How much is their book, please? Fifty pence for the week. Thank you for your business, sir. Au revoir, madame. Like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. There's lots of talk of Tom Cutter's treasure. It's said to still be buried on the island somewhere. Jewels and gold and all the usual in a chest. When I was younger, my mate and I would search for it. We were convinced it was up on that hill on the western side of the island. The way the story goes, Tom Cutter would spend hours up there just looking out over the sea. We never found so much as a singular coin, though. Racismant, we progress. Now rub the mineral oil onto the bird with this brush. This will make the motor oil easier to remove. I scrubbed the poor thing with mineral oil. I suppose we're fighting oil with oil. Evin, 
Now I must apply the detergent to the brush. Precisement, we progress. Now rub the detergent onto the bird with this brush to remove the oils. We progress. Now we must rinse the bird. I will turn on the taps. We are almost finished, mademoiselle. Dry the bird with these towels. Splendid work, Mademoiselle Musher. I confess, I didn't think we could pull it off, Poirot. Well done all round. Now, Mademoiselle, all that remains is to return our feathered friend to Sanctuary Co. Oh, thank you, Mr. Poirot. You are such a dear. You're blushing, old fellow. Nonsense. Gladys won't be happy when she sees this. Tractor, do you? Yes, please. On me way. The home guard is an old old gents doddering around in their great war kit. There's quite a few lads like me who are itching to get into it, but weren't allowed to enlist. We train. We know how to fight. She has enough candles in there to light up a church. I beg your pardon, mademoiselle? I'm so clumsy. Mademoiselle, may I speak to you? Of course. Gladys is very upset with Will. What has it got to do with me? She believes that you are trying to come between them. Oh, I didn't mean... I, I didn't know. I have no reason to hurt either one of them. I was just... Garage was a place to get away from the island. Would you tell that to Gladys? I believe it would ease her mind. Of course, of course. Thank you for telling me. And so, Hastings, we come to the third act of my story. You have spread your investigations beyond the island to the town of Leathercombe Bay. This is most excellent. You have met the rest of our cast, and seen how a favor performed can earn a favor in return. Even now I suspect certain suggestions present themselves to you? It's obvious there was more than one mystery on Sea Drift Island. In fact, almost everyone seems to have something to hide. Precisement. Keep that in mind. Few cases are so neat and tidy as to have only one person up to no good. You must first dispose of the red herrings before the fox he can be treed. What next, Poirot? Night has fallen on Seadrift Island, and with it the fog has crept in from the sea. 
And this is the night the ghost of Tom Cutter is said to walk. Remember the other two vignettes I shared with you as well. A murder of a girl. A ritual. As before, if you find yourself unable to progress, I will assist with the magic of the finger of suspicion. Ah, yes. Time now for a third clue to its secret. The third clue? It is desk. Power? Lamp? The lamp on the desk, of course. The finger of suspicion must be powered somehow by the desk lamp. Well, Hastings, how does your investigation go? Oh, fine. No problems at all, old man. I am glad to hear that, my friend. Hastings, answer the door like a good fellow. Poirot, what the bloody hell is going on? I have spoken to Madame Marshall. Yes, I understand she gave you the third note. She told me. I will begin a search for the typewriter on which the notes were written. There can't be many typewriters on the island. One that has been stolen from Mademoiselle Donnelly. The devil you say? And yours? But see here, something very precious to me has been stolen. Indeed? And what has been stolen? A, a photograph of Arlena, the only one I carry with me. It was taken some time this afternoon from my room. The door to your room was unlocked or forced? It was locked. But hang it all, the, the balcony door was not. Poirot, th that photograph means a great deal to me. You must find it. Uh, you see how I was plagued at every turn, Hastings? With the investigations I would, under ordinary circumstances, reject out of hand? Yet on Sea Drift Island, everything, even the smallest bother, was connected, and therefore could not be ignored. I will see what I can do, Captain Marshall. This holiday is a nightmare. I fear the nightmare it only begins. From the looks of these betting receipts, the Major is his bookmaker's best and unluckiest customer. I think this room belongs to Major Barry. I believe we've damaged Major Barry's suitcase sufficiently, Hastings. Bravo, Hastings. You have solved one crime at least. now. What do you think you're doing? Retrieving some stolen property. What? What do you mean? This afternoon we see you are spying upon Madame Marshall. Her photograph goes missing. Your expressed admiration for beautiful women is more of an obsession with Elena Marshall, is it not? How dare you? Blaster, if you will. The proof was beneath your pillow. What do you intend to do now? I will let Captain Marshall decide what is to be done with you. Marshall has a reputation for hard dealing in the city. Monsieur Begby has their dog, Baskerville. The Great Dane? Yes, I've seen him snoring on the hearth in the monk's hood. Do you think you could train him? Oh, I expect so. To do what? There is a cat in the Leathercombe post office. That will do quite well.
This is certainly significant. The sample does not match the note. Hello, Mr. Porro. Monsieur Redfern, may I join you? If you like. I think that you enjoy life. Indeed I do. And why not? Why not indeed? I make you my felicitation on the fact. Well, thanks. May I offer you the piece of advice? Please. A very wise friend of mine in the police force said to me years ago, Hercule, my friend, if you would know tranquility, avoid women. I'm afraid it's a bit late for that. I'm married, you know. Your wife, she is a very charming woman. Very accomplished. She is, I think, very fond of you also. I'm very fond of her. I am delighted to hear it. Look here, Monsieur Poirot. What are you getting at? Les femmes? I know something of them. Do you? One can be a pleasure. More than that are capable of complicating life. And the English, oh, they conduct their affairs so... so... Oh, they baffle Poirot. Monsieur Redfern, I state it to you plainly. If it was necessary for you to come here, why in the name of heaven did you bring your wife? I don't know what you mean. You know perfectly. I am not so foolish as to argue with an infatuated man. I utter only the word of caution. You've been listening to these damned scandalmongers. Nothing to do but make up lies all day. Just because a woman's good-looking, they're down on her like harpies. It's pure jealousy, nothing more. Are you really as young as all that? I see. You were trying to defuse the situation before it explodes. Exact Hastings. I could see the current circling around Alena Marshall, not knowing from what direction the danger would come, or whom it would be directed toward. It was all I could do. RD, I say, Poirot. I'll wager this is Miss Darnley's typewriter. Beyond a doubt, you are correct. After we test it against the notes, we will return it to her. The sample does not match the note. The door is locked, but I can hear the voices from within. Perhaps we should listen a bit closer, Hastings. It's why we came here. Our hopes and dreams. Our future. Gone. I 
You keep telling me to leave it. I know you, Oakley, darling. I know your temper. There must be some justice in this world. There is, darling. In the end, justice will win out. The door is locked, but I can hear the voices from within. Perhaps we should listen a bit closer, Hastings. Je vous ai battu. Je vous casse. Je vous maudis. Je vous ai battu. Je vous casse. Je vous maudis. Je vous ai battu. Je vous casse. Je vous maudis. Sounds like Miss Marshall is doing her French lesson. If that is true, Hastings, they are the most unusual French lessons. She says, I beat you, I break you, I curse you. I say that's a bit rum. Good evening, Madame Redvan. Oh, good evening, Mr. Poirot. Is there anything I can do? No. No, there is not. Do you know what I'm most sick of in this place? Pity. Do you think I can't see? All the time people are saying, poor Mrs. Redfern, that poor little woman. I'm not little. I'm tall. They say little because they're sorry for me. And I can't bear it. I have obtained for you another sketch pad. That's... that's very kind of you. It is a small thing, madame, I realize. No, really, Monsieur Poirot. It is very thoughtful. Madame, the Alena Marshals of this world do not count. Nonsense. I assure you it is true. The Dominion is of the moment and for the moment. To count. Really and truly to matter, a woman must have goodness or brains. The Alena Marshals are the ones to be pitied. Your husband loves you, madame. I know it. You can't know it. Yes, yes, I know it. I have seen him looking at you. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Patience, only patience is required. It's all right. I'm better now. You are a very kind man, Monsieur Poirot. Thank you. It is an unusual wreck for a garden, that. It's to keep the clay of the court smooth. And from the look of that play, it's about time for a good rake. Someone's been careless leaving a perfectly good shovel lying about.
Ah, Mr. Poirot. Miss Brewster? An unusual place to find the ballet teacher? Not entirely. My past seems to still be haunting me. The girl you mentioned who died? Yes, Mr. Poirot. I need your help. If it is in my power. She was a student of mine in Brixham. A number of students from a nearby girls' school would come to us for ballet instruction. Millie Parsons was one of those. Returning to the school from a, a ballet class, she was attacked and strangled to death. I want you to find her killer. What a coincidence, Poirot. No sooner do we begin to look into the Parsons girl's murder when we are asked to do just that. Coincidence, Hastings? Poirot does not trust such coincidences. Do you know the significance of their pole and their circle? I think perhaps. Do you? I have my suspicions, mademoiselle. You do? The chicken feathers stained with blood, Hastings? You speak of their voodoo, do you not? My God, I hoped I was wrong. How can it be here? Millie Parsons was the girl who died several months ago? Yes, in May. The police investigated. At one point, the rector of the church was suspected, but nothing was ever proved. Do you recall the name of this man? I don't think I ever knew it. I couldn't bring myself to follow the investigation. The details, it was just far too painful. What was the name of the school where Millie Parsons was a student? Miss Porter's School for Young Ladies. It was on the other side of a small wood, less than half a mile away from our ballet academy. Where have you encountered voodoo before? Understand I don't believe in it, but at the girls' school Millie Parsons attended, there was a math instructor named Gideon Fell. He left the school under some sort of cloud a few weeks after Millie died, and with only days left in the term. It had something to do with voodoo. He was a practitioner? I know no more than that, I'm afraid. Do you believe in the power of voodoo, Mademoiselle Brewster? Me? No, of course not. Superstitious nonsense. But if one does believe in something like that, well, it can come to have an enormous power over one. Don't you agree? Certainement. I should be getting back. Please let me know if you learn anything about Millie. I shall do so, mademoiselle. You have my word. Poirot, how can you investigate a case that happened months ago and miles away from here? Colonel Weston will be able to request the files. Voodoo in South Devon? A rum business. As you say. The blind is still holding up well. Very well, Hastings. If you insist, we shall listen for a moment. I'm crazy about you. Crazy. You drive me mad. You do care a little. Do you care? Oh, of course, Patrick, darling. I adore you. You know that. Let me show you how much. And we have listened quite enough, Hastings. Filthy night, eh, Poirot? It is that. We, oui, Captain Marshall. Any luck finding Arlena's photograph? I have recovered the photograph. You're a bloody marvel, I'll give you that. Who had it? Where was it? An overzealous admirer of Mrs. Marshall took it. Stolen by the writer of those damned threatening notes. 
You may rest assured that is not the case. It was a lapse in judgment to be sure, but no harm was intended. Very well. I'll accept your request, even if I don't quite understand it. If there's anything I can do in return... It is kind of you to offer, and indeed there may be something. Name it. Here is your chance, Hastings. Use their little graces. What do your deductions suggest to you would be their question most important? Your daughter had some difficulty at school, I believe? Well, what if she did? What has it got to do with you? Was this school Mrs. Porter's school for the young ladies? Yes, if you must know. But I fail to see what that could possibly have to do with anything. Thank you for the photograph. If you'll excuse me. Well done, Hastings. A deduction worthy of power. Mr. Poirot, you dear, dear man. We've confessed all to one another. We both pledged never to forget an anniversary, haven't we, Oakley? <laughs> yes, darling. And we'd like to thank you for your efforts on behalf of our anniversary, isn't that right, Oakley? Yes, darling. I love my knitting book. And I'm equally delighted with my cord, more than you can know. You chose Sea Drift Island to hunt for the treasure, did you not? I confess, I wanted to keep the search low-key, but you deserve the truth. Is that coin then a part of the treasure, do you think? You did find it on the island, then. Didn't I tell you so, Kerry? Yes, darling, you did. What can you tell me about the coin? A 1689 gold guinea, in fine condition. The period is right very well could be part of the treasure. Have you found it? Unfortunately, no. That coin only. But we are going to find it. I'm convinced the island summit is the starting point. Where do you go from there? If Carter left a clue, it's bound to be somewhere in the smuggler's end. I thank you again for their shawl most marvelous. I'm so pleased you like it. May you get good use from it. He already has. I will not interrupt your celebration further. Hastings, allow them to enjoy their anniversary in peace. Of course, old man. Sorry. It's the ghost of Tom Cutter! Steady, my friend. We must keep our wits about us. We must follow. Hastings, downstairs, to the cellar! Vanished, into thin air. Wet footprints in the dirt floor of the cellar. What have we here, Hastings? Wet footprints in... A new day, Hastings. August 25th. 
the day that murder came to Sea Drift Island. What have we learned? Much of the mystery seems to swirl around Mrs. Marshall, or Alina Stewart as her fans call her. You agree? Yes, that seems clear. And two mysteries are solved. The photograph is found beneath Major Barry's pillow. The typewriter of the most charming Mademoiselle Darnley is discovered beneath the bed of the Redferns. Christine Redfern has reason to send such notes, perhaps? Her husband's attentions to Mademoiselle Stewart are obvious to all? At last, there is the murder unsolved of Millet Parsons. Why does Mademoiselle Brewster ask Poirot to take it up? Several of the guests at the Smuggler's Rest Hotel appear to have in common Brixham, the place where she died. Mademoiselle Brewster, Stephen Lane, the former vicar, even Mademoiselle Linda Marshall, who it now appears was a student at Millie's school. Yes, Miss Porter's school for young ladies. What happened there? Voodoo rituals? An anthropology teacher awakens in fear to the pounding of the pagan drums? Voodoo? Nonsense, if you ask me. Perhaps. But as Miss Darnley said, not nonsense to those who believe. And do not forget Tom Cutter's ghost. We saw. I admit that gave me a turn. But ghosts? Voodoo? Poirot, even for you, this case has elements of the sensational. No sensible person could credit. Perhaps. But I will give you the very important clue. Think on the nature of Alina Stewart. Watch as the investigation proceeds, Hastings. Until we can understand fully and completely exactly the kind of person Alina Stewart was, we shall not be able to see clearly the kind of person who took her life. As before, if you find yourself unable to progress, I will assist with the magic of the Finger of Suspicion. Ah yes. Time now for a fourth clue to its secret. The clue is... Draw. Power. Lamp. Desk. Draw. Do I search the drawer for a switch, perhaps? Or is it something more subtle? I say no more? When you are ready, my friend, we will return to Sea Drift Island. It is a morning of sunshine, warm breezes, and a murder most foul. Morning, Monsieur Poirot. Any more thoughts about what we found in the ruins? Poirot always has their thoughts, Monsieur Lane. Who can tell which will prove to be most significant? What are your plans for this morning? I've heard there's a fine church in these parts, St. Patrick in the Coombe. I'm going to try and track it down. What illness forced you to leave your position? It was... I, I confess it was nerves, Monsieur Poirot. I did not mean to intrude. No, it's quite all right. No sense in my hiding the fact. Women, they are so often at the source of evil. Do you think so? Man alive, don't you feel it in the air? All around you, we spoke of it yesterday at the ruins. The presence of evil. Oui, Monsieur Lane, I feel it. I am able to assist you in your search, I think. Oh? I found this pamphlet at the establishment of Mrs. Hughes in Leathercombe. Oh, this is marvelous. And there's a map and everything. Let's see, it'll make a fine hike over the moors, too. Thank you so much. Monsieur Lane, I wonder if I may ask you the questions somewhat painful. Your kind gift has lifted my spirits considerably. I will answer if I can. Your church was near Brixham, I believe. Oh, yes, I had a small living there. Why? Are you familiar with Mrs. Potter's School for Young Ladies? Why, I... Oh, yes. Uh, Miss Potter herself and several of the girls attended my church. Not as many as I would have liked, uh, but some. Do you recall the Conservatoire de Dance near there? 
Oh, yes. Miss Brewster, who is stopping here, was an instructor there. Does the name Millie Parsons mean anything to you? The murder. Yes, it... it caused quite a sensation. A, a teacher at Miss Porter's was accused. No charges were brought. Simply the ruin of a man's reputation. He may have been misguided. Even driven. But the Parsons girl brought it upon herself. Of that, I am convinced. And then, only a few weeks later, another murder. They must have been connected. And, and of that second crime, he was wholly innocent, I have no doubt. So what he said in a moment of weakness... What did this teacher say to you? I may no longer be of the cloth, Mr. Poirot, but I will keep the confidences learnt while I was still in God's service. Even if it allows a murderer to go free? Please! God must judge, not... not I. Tell me of the second crime. It received quite a bit of press at the time. Alice Corrigan was the name. Strangled, as was the Parsons girl. The husband was suspected, but again, no arrest was ever made. I'm convinced the two crimes were the work of one man. And the motive? Women are at the heart of many tragedies. In this case, they were the victims of tragedy. Can you doubt? They brought it upon themselves, through fornication, adultery, and godlessness. It is my nature to doubt, Monsieur Lane. Yes, of course. You're a detective. Still, I would think your experience would have paid witness to the truth of my words. I may have misunderstood and unburdened myself too freely. I, I must be off if I hope to reach the church and be back before it gets too late. Thank you again for the information. The fellow is right round the bend, Poirot. He practically admitted he knew Millie Parsons' killer yet did nothing because she was a girl, and somehow deserved it? That's monstrous. It is true he appears to be quite selective when it comes to forgiveness and compassion. Yet it may very well be that decision to keep silent caused his breakdown. His pain runs deep, and the struggle, it continues. There may be hope for him still. Mademoiselle, if I may have a moment of your time? I only have a few minutes, Monsieur Poirot. I'm meeting Mrs. Redfern at Sanctuary Cove at half past ten. I will come straight to the point, Mademoiselle. You were a student at Miss Potter's School for Young Ladies in Brixham, were you not? I was. I'm not any more, though. Millie Parsons was a classmate of yours? Yes. A close friend? Nah, uh, not really. We knew her, my friends and I, to speak to. She seemed a harmless sort. Rather sweet, actually. Why did you leave school? Monsieur Poirot, I like you. But I'm not sure you have the right to ask me that question. Did you know an instructor named Gideon Fell? Yes. We had him for anthropology. He was a poor teacher? He was all right, I guess. I am very interested in anthropology. That helped, I suppose. What most interested you in the class? Superstition. Much of what we call superstition has a basis, in fact. Religious practices and so on. You did not like him? At first, he seemed all right. He took several of us to the picture show to see a horror film called Curse of the Islands. The film it was frightening to you? Mm, a bit, I suppose. But I found it quite interesting, actually. But then he started acting. 
strangely towards some of the girls. He... he was creepy. Always making comments to girls when he thought no one could hear. Complimenting them on how they looked. This interest, it was more than politeness? A lot more. Was he interested in Millet Parsons? She told me he had followed her once in the woods. He grabbed her wrist. When she tried to break away, he said how much he liked her hair. And her... her frock. She broke away and threatened to tell Miss Porter. She said he looked at her with his face all twisted up. It was horrible, she said. Millie told Miss Porter of this incident? No. One of the other girls had already complained and she did nothing. She accused the girl of trying to make trouble for Mr. Fell because he gave her bad marks. After Millie's death, you said nothing of Mr. Fell? I did. The police looked into it. They said he had an alibi. But I knew. My friends and I knew. You don't believe me, do you? Au contraire, I have known many alibis that seemed unbreakable, only to shatter as easily as glass when the right force was applied. He did it, Monsieur Poirot. He killed Millie. I... I have to change into my swimming costume now. Will you excuse me? Of course. Thank you for speaking with me. I say, Poirot, do you think you can break this fell character's alibi? If I can, Hastings, Miss Brewster and the police will have their answer. The door is locked, but I can hear the voices from within. Perhaps we should listen a bit closer, Hastings. Are you going for a swim? Of course. It's a beautiful day. With her? Don't, for goodness sake, get into the habit of being jealous of every pretty woman we come across. She's not just any pretty woman. She's... she's different. She's a bad lot. Yes, she is. She'll do you harm, Patrick. Please, give it up. Let's go away from here. Don't be ridiculous, Christine. Now we have heard all we can here, Hastings. These are the binoculars, most splendid. But I cannot see anything of particular interest here. Monsieur Poirot. Good morning, Madame Marshall. I regret I have not yet found the writer of those notes. I wouldn't worry myself if I were you. In fact, I'd like you to forget about them. You have learned the identity of the author? Yes. And if there's any further bother, I will deal with it myself. Is that clear? That could be dangerous. An argument will not assist us, Hastings. Better to comply. I will do as you ask. 
That is a scent most charming that you wear. Thank you. You're very kind. It's an expensive indulgence, especially for the beach. But I like it so. You are going for the swim? No, no. I wanted to use a float. Use this one with my compliments. You won't be using it? No. I am certain of that. Do something for me, will you? Anything. Hey, Stings, do not become smitten with this woman. She is charming, yes. But it will cloud your ability to investigate. Sorry, Mara. She's just so damned attractive. Don't tell anyone where I am. Everyone will follow me about so. I just want for once to be alone. She wants to be alone? I don't believe that for a minute. Very good, Hastings. You read her character well. I concur. She has the rendezvous, I think. But with whom? Morning, Poirot. See my wife anywhere about? Has Madame risen so early? Well, she's not in her room. Lovely day. Think I'll have a bathe right away. Got a lot of typing to do this morning. Morning, Marshal. You look for Madame Redfern? Christine is off sketching somewhere. I say, it's that North chap again. What course of action do you suggest, Hastings? Ask Mrs. Redfern to make a sketch of him. An excellent idea, my friend. Then Colonel Weston can send the picture to Scotland Yard for identification. Monsieur Poirot, thank you again for the sketch pad. It is my pleasure, madame. I intend to make good use of it today. What will you sketch today? I'm meeting Linda at Sanctuary Cove at half past ten. While she swims, I will sketch her guillemots for her. You are kind to take an interest in her. She's having a rough time of it, I'm afraid. I believe you are correct. A friend now will be of great help, I think. Madame, do you have the time to make this small sketch for Poirot? Why? I'd be delighted to. It's the least I can do. There is a man at the landing of the sea tractor. Do you think you could make the portrait of him? I don't see why not. I have a little time before Linda will be ready. And Madame, if you could contrive to do so, Without his knowledge? Oh, I must say it's rather exciting having a detective on holiday. Monsieur Poirot, any luck with finding my typewriter? Oui, mademoiselle. This is it, is it not? Yes, indeed. Wherever did you find it? I would rather not say at present. You are being most mysterious.
It is my nature to be mysterious, I am afraid. Well, I'm happy to have it back. Thank you. Please let me know if there is any way I can repay you. I will. Where are you off to, may I ask? The ledgers to read my book. It's a rather good thriller by Graham Greene. Do you know his work? Bien. He is an excellent writer. Then I've a tennis date with Ken, uh, Mr. Marshall, Mrs. Redfern and Mr. Gardner at 12. I'll just put this typewriter in my room, then I'm off. Enjoy your day, mademoiselle. And you, Monsieur Poirot. And thanks again. Do you? Yes, please. On me way. Mr. Poirot, I wanted to thank you for helping to clear up the misunderstanding between Madison and me. How she could think I'd ever be interested in that schoolgirl is beyond me. I can't help it if some foolish child decides on her own to start hanging about the garage. I know it sounds silly, but I think she was only doing it because she wanted to pinch my shovel. Morning, sir. I was just off to do an errand. Say, you don't happen to know anything about motor cars, do you? Yes, I do. Hastings, what is this you make me say? I know nothing of motor cars. I do, Poirot. Let's see what he's on about. What would you like to know? Major Barry's car needs its points cleaned. He wants it as soon as possible, but I have to test the motor on the sea tractor. It's been a bit dodgy lately. I wouldn't want to strand anyone on the island. I'd be in your debt if you could help me out. The young scoundrel asks such a thing of the world's greatest detective? Hang on, Poirot. It wouldn't hurt to have a bright lad like Jenks on our side. I see no points on the car of Major Barry. And the motor cars, they are filthy. Nonsense. You'd think you'd never heard of soap. I've never cleaned points myself. But all we need are some instructions. The current issue of Motor Enthusiast magazine has an exceptionally clear article on the subject. Out! Something pricked me. It's a sliver of metal. Must be magnetic. Can't say I see much point in hanging on to a magnetic sliver of metal. But you never know. As you say, Hastings, you never know. I will not attempt to pilot the motor car. There is no need to leave Leather Combe to solve the crime. You can be quite frustrating at times, Poirot. Motor cars hold no interest for Poirot. Dash it all, Poirot! Your little idiosyncrasies are infuriating! Nonsense. They are a part of my charm.
It appears to be stuck that way. It appears to be stuck that way. Cannot comply. I will not do that. I am sorry, mon ami, but I do not believe that course will help you. Without error, mon ami. Your instincts are well honed, mon ami. Mm. The puzzle, it is one piece closer to completion. Your current course of action, it is a mystery to Poirot. Done, old man. There is not enough soap in all of Devon to restore my hands. Morning, sir. Got the tractor motor purring like a kitten. Any luck with Major Barry's automobile? Why, yes. Against all expectation, I have cleaned the tips with much success. Beg your pardon? Points, old man. And the points as well. Smashing. Much obliged, sir. The village is practically abandoned. Corned beef sandwich, and well past its prime by the smell of it. Look at the size of that brute. Hello, Mr. Poirot. Not like you to look so out of sorts. Mr. Beck. Where would you look for Tom Cutter's treasure? If it's there, my guess would be Cutter's cave. But folk have tried for centuries to find that treasure with nothing to show for it. Foolish to try if you ask me. Good day to you, Monsieur Begby. If you'd like a game of darts, just ask. Morning, Poirot. Major, you are here already? I've already worked with the dog. He'll do as I say. Are you ready? Proceed, Major. Stand at attention, Baskerville. Heal. It's a miracle, that is.
sit. Easy as anything to train a dog. You just know how to talk to them. Your skill is extraordinary, Major. Now I will open the door. Command him to enter and we will let nature take its course. Ready when you are, Poirot. Enter Baskerville. Baskerville, enter the shop. Uh, he won't budge, Poirot. Can't say what the trouble is. Have you any way to lure him inside? Hastings, do you have anything that might attract Baskerville? That is exactly as Poirot was thinking, Hastings. Was that that poor Baskerville again? You'd think he'd learn not to come round here anymore. We have no need to send the telegram, Hastings. Voila, Madame Hughes. The case of the missing post is solved. Why, do you mean to say my dear little Chloe knocked those letters back there by accident? That your cat pushed them there to have the room for the catnap is fact. Whether it was an accident, it is not for Poirot to say. Oh, Mr. Poirot, how can I ever thank you? It is my pleasure to assist you, Madame. However, there is a kindness you can do Poirot in return. What is it? Choose wisely, Hastings. I could certainly use a discount in your shop. A well-turned-out gentleman like you. I'm sure you can wire your bank for any funds you may need. With my bird off in the army and the prices of things these days, I need every penny to keep going. Would you take advantage of the Lady Hastings? No, no, of course not. I could make good use of your testing equipment. Excellent, Hastings. You are sharpening the detective instincts. I'm not sure. You are a detective. Colonel Weston will vouch for me. Ah, oh, well then. Of course you can. I'm happy to be of service, I'm sure. Merci, madame. You do that great service for Poirot. We have quite a few books for sale, sir.
The tablets of Monsieur Lane are most certainly Troyana. The blood found at the monastery ruins, it is from the chicken. The grenadine, it is composed of the juice from the pomegranate, sugar, and water. Hello, Poirot. Enjoying your holidays? I will let you be the judge of that, my friend. I have several things to discuss with you. Carry on. Mrs. Marshall has been receiving threatening messages. The devil, you say? From whom? That is yet unclear. I would like to compare them to the type on your machine. You think I've been sending them? I must try every possibility, my friend, however remote. Be my guest. There, you see Hastings. The E, the M, and the H. This is the typewriter used to write the threatening notes beyond any doubt. There is no doubt. The notes were typed on this machine. But that's impossible. No one visits you here? Well, of course. Many people do. In addition to my regular police duties, there's the home guard. The evacuation. Hang on. You have thought of something? I'd hate for it to be true. That girl at the hotel. She popped in with all sorts of questions about the evacuation. I think she wanted to be told the hotel was being closed. I expect the order any day now, by the way. Was it Gladys Nerakot? The maid? No. Sending threatening notes to a guest would get her sacked at once. Was it Linda Marshall? Yes, as a matter of fact it was. Bit nasty that, writing threatening messages to her own stepmother. Very nasty indeed. Especially since she apparently also stole Mademoiselle Darnley's typewriter and hid it in Christine Redfern's room to incriminate her. A competent deduction, Hastings. There is hope for you yet? Is Mrs. Castle a member of the Home Guard? Yes, she volunteered, although she hasn't been of much use. Why do you say that? The sightings of U-boats don't match what my other watchers are reporting. I'm not sure she's truly watching at all. I am afraid it is worse than that. She has a German radio, a code book, and a signal lantern in her safe. Good God, a fifth columnist here in Leathercombe Bay. I'll have her arrested immediately. Please do not as yet. If you watch her, she may lead you to her associates. Ah, oh, you're right. I'll have her followed if she leaves the island. Excellent! What can you tell me of Alice Corrigan's murder case? Nasty bit of work. A husband had a motive, but an unbreakable alibi as well. Not my district, but I have some notes at my office. Could you obtain for me the summary of the report? I'll have it sent over from Kingsbridge this afternoon. Did the report on the Millie Parsons case arrive? Yes, here it is. I was in London through most of it, in home guard and evacuation meetings. 
I hope to have a look at it again once things quiet down. If they quiet down, that is. Ah, merci. I will read as I make my notes. Hastings, look over these notes of the alibi of the teacher Gideon Fell. Tell me what you see. Something about the film? Fell was alone there for two hours. What is the most important fact concerning that film and Fell's alibi? The title, Curse of the Islands? And why is it significant? Linda Marshall told us Fell took her and some friends to see it. And this tells you? He knew the story already. And the theater ticket he had in his possession for the 12th of April? He bought the ticket, but he never went in. You have it, my friend. Well done. Colonel? Yes? The Millie Parsons affair. This alibi of the teacher, Gideon Fell. It does not hold the liquid. Water, Poirot. It does not hold its water. Oh? There are witnesses. Girls at their school that will tell you that Monsieur Fell took them to see Curse of the Islands before that night. You don't say. Fell, he leaves the restaurant at 7.40. He buys the ticket at the theater nearby, a matter of a few moments only. Then he walks to the corpse. He is there shortly before 15 minutes to 9, the time Millie Parsons' ballet class it is finished. He waits. The girl arrives. The murder, it is done. He walks back to the movie theater in time to see the end upon the screen. By Joe, Poirot, you're astounding. I had the information you lacked, my friend. That is all. I need to write up a report on this at once. I've assigned a man to keep an eye on Mrs. Castle, should she leave Leathercombe Bay. Like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. The home guard isn't all old gents doddering around in their great war kit. There's quite a few lads like me who are itching to get into it, but weren't allowed to enlist. We train. We know how to fight. be a map. The number of paces north, east, and north again. And their starting point? Albert Bagby at the Monk's Hood Inn told you that Tom Carter would spend hours on the island's summit. It was his favorite spot on the island. And we found Gardner poking about up there as well. I'll bet he's come to the same conclusion I have. This is a map to Tom Carter's treasure. Certainly empty this morning. I believe Captain Marshall will be swimming shortly. Everyone else off on excursions, I expect. Major Barry wanted to go into Knightsbridge if his car was fixed. The Major? He has business in Kingsbridge? Oh, he was complaining of the lack of privacy when using the phone in Leathercombe Bay Post Office. I can't imagine what he has to be so secretive about. Can you? Okay. No, darling. 
you do not take the excursion? I was saying to Mr. Gardner only this morning, we simply must make an excursion to Dartmoor. It's quite near and the associations are all so romantic, aren't they, Oakley? Yes, darling. I've always wanted to visit the Dartmoor prison. You do not knit at the ledges this morning? No, Miss Darnley was there before us and didn't seem to be in the mood for chatting. So we came here. Didn't want to disturb her, did we, Oakley? No, darling. The motor car, it is repaired. Oh? Isn't that splendid, Oakley? Yes, darling. Oakley, I don't believe I've got that second shade of purple wool. It's in the second drawer of the bureau in our bedroom, or it might be the third. Yes, darling. Good morning, Mr. Redfern. I don't see anything good about it. Goodness, he's in a mood. There is no need to disturb Mademoiselle Danny. Let her enjoy her book. North 20, East 19, then North 15. Let's see where we end up, shall we? One, two, three, four, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, Airbnb. Now East. One, Two, three, four, ten, eleven, twelve, Hastings. Three more steps will put me in the center of the, what did you call it? The ad service court. Poirot, something is buried there. That's why the ground keeps settling. Dig! Dig! Against my better judgment? A treasure chest! Oh, that... that's... Yes, Hastings, we've uncovered the spot where their monks, they dumped their old brandy casks. Congratulations! I was so sure. I suggest another visit to Monsieur Bagby, if you insist on pursuing this. Good idea, old fellow. Um... First, you'd better finish filling in the hole and raking the tennis court. Tractor, do you? Yes, please. On me way. There's not so much to do in Leathercombe Bay now that the evacuation's been done. Most places have closed up except the chemists. Mrs. Hughes has to stay because she's the post office too. And lending library if it comes to that. But it's the post that must be seen too. Now that the smuggler's end is closed, the only pub is the monk's hood. Mr. Bagby is trying to stay open as long as he can. Once the hotel is closed, there
there won't be much trade for him. Your dog? He has not returned? No, and I'm a bit put out with you and Major Barry. Did you stick that mad cat of Mrs. Hughes on him? Well, it was not the outcome I intended, I assure you. Yes, well, I'd ask you to leave well enough alone in future, Mr. Poirot. I told you Baskerville needed no training. Did you not say the key to finding the treasure was to start on the island summit? Estings, we are not here for the treasure hunt. Well, that's what most believe, eh? What of it? The directions we... I discovered led to where that tennis court is now. Don't tell me you dug up Mrs. Castle's tennis court. Yes, very amusing. Have you any idea where we could have gone wrong? Well, let me see. Oh, rot. Oh, rot. Why do you say this? Well, if you started at the current high point on the island, you would easily go astray. The current high point? Yes, you misunderstood me. I? Poirot? He does not misunderstand. But you have. Let me explain. That hill is the highest point on the island now. But of course it wasn't back in Tom Cutter's day. That was long before the hotel, remember? They leveled the land around there when they built it. The highest point used to be... Hmm. Let me see. You know that grassy path out from the main entrance of Ways? The one that leads to the bathing beach? Well, that used to be much higher. That's where old Tom used to sit and watch. You really did dig up the tennis court? Good day to you, Monsieur Bagby. If you'd like a game of darts, just ask. Like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. I expect you've heard about our ghost, the smuggler Tom Cutter. He used to bring in his goods to the cove on Sea Drift Island, they now call Cutter's Cove. And he was regular at the pub on the island. That's where he met his end, they say, hung by agents of the Crown. There'll be those who say he was shot or drowned. But my old Garfa knew the story. And he swore they strung old Tom up from the hotel side. Let him observe his non-existent birds in peace, Estes. North 20, East 19, then North 15. Let's see where we end up, shall we? One, two, three, four. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Hastings. Here, too, is the depression in the ground, remember? Dig, Poirot, dig! Luckily for you, Poirot is an expert gardener. You have seen my vegetable marrows. There! You've hit something! Tom Cutter's treasure is... Three gold dots. Congratulations. At least they're gold. Oh, better fill in the hole, Poirot. 
wouldn't do for anyone to injure themselves. Mademoiselle Brewster, you have had a pleasant morning? Good morning, Mr. Poirot. Well, I was, until somebody chucked something at me from the balcony up there. Mademoiselle, I have looked into Millie's murder. And? I believe I have found the one responsible for her death. Who was it? Colonel Weston is having his men follow up on certain facts I placed before him. While I cannot tell you with absolute certainty, nevertheless, the indications are very strong that the one they will question is our man. Every instinct tells me he is the man, and I promise you, he will be brought to justice. Mr. Poirot, I can't tell you how much this means to me. She was a good friend to you, young Millie. Yes, yes she was. She was an innocent. Mr. Poirot, I can't bear it when the innocent suffer. You have the good heart, mademoiselle. I am happy I was able to assist you. Something was thrown at you? I was having my usual morning swim at about half past ten, when all of a sudden, whoosh, something hit the water very near my head. You do not know what it was, the projectile? No, I would have swum down for it. But the water's pretty deep here, and my ears won't take the pressure. If you'll excuse me, it's time for my row. The exercise will do me good. What have we here, Hastings? What have we here, Hastings? You presume that this would be the choice of Poirot? I think not. As you yourself would say, well played, Hastings. You have correctly deduced that Tom Carter's Ton 80 was the key to unlocking their secret door. Thanks, old man. Voila! The ghost of Tom Cutter becomes someone wearing a coat covered with luminescent paint. Footprints everywhere! One man, no ghost, passed along here many times. know my friend Hastings? I could blunder about in these tunnels for hours while who knows what crimes are committed in my absence. I need some means to ensure I am traveling in the proper direction.
The door, it is locked tight. The door is locked, but I can hear the voices from within. Perhaps we should listen a bit closer, Hastings. I say, Poirot, he seems to be typing up quite a storm. There is no need to disturb Mademoiselle Danley. Let her enjoy her book. Let her enjoy their sunshine hastings. Madame Redfern. Oh, Monsieur Poirot, I have the sketch you asked me for. Merci, Madame. I'm not in the mood to talk at the moment. Do you? Yes, please. On me way. There's lots of talk of Tom Cutter's treasure. It's said to still be buried on the island somewhere. Jewels and gold and all the usual in a chest. When I was younger, me mates and I would search for it. We were convinced it was up on that hill on the western side of the island. The way the story goes, Tom Cutter would spend hours up there just looking out over the sea. We never found so much as a singular coin, though. That is not such a good idea. Could you send a sketch to Scotland Yard for identification? Be glad to. I've seen the fellow about. You think he's up to no good? I do. I'll try to have an answer for you this afternoon. Merci. Au revoir, monsieur. Hello. Somebody's having a bath. Leaving it rather late in the morning, weren't they? You have done well, Hastings. Perhaps a misstep or two here or there. But overall, I give you high marks indeed. Thanks, Poirot. Very decent of you. But now, your metal will be tested. Recall where each suspect was last seen. I have marked their positions on the map here. As you probe their alibis, we will update the map so that perhaps you can see who had the most opportunity to kill Madame Musher. And do not neglect the inhabitants of Leathercombe Bay. 
They may also have information of importance. I'll be thorough, old man. You can count on me. Excellent. And of course, if you find yourself unable to progress, we will consult the magic of the Finger of Suspicion. Magic, my eye. But at any rate, it's time now for a fifth clue to its secret. The clue is Magnet. Magnet. At last, a clue that suggests something useful. I am glad the clue it pleases you. I shall place it next to the Finger of Suspicion. Use it as you will. When you are ready, my friend, we will return to Sea Drift Island. It is now late morning. The time it is precisely 11.40 when the robot with Patrick Redfern at the oars and Emily Brewster in the bow rounds the headland into Cutter's Cove. Hello. Who's that? It looks like Mrs. Marshall. So it does. We don't want to land here, do we? Oh, plenty of time. That's odd. Why is Mrs. Marshall lying in the shade? Hello, Alena. Mademoiselle Brewster senses something. The body, the way it lies. There is something unnatural in the angle of the outspread arms. Alena? Monsieur Redfern too, he hesitates. And then... No. Alena! No! Is she...? She's dead! Oh, God. She's been strangled! Alena! I was in my room, as yet unaware of the tragedy. Mr. Poirot, there you are. Mademoiselle, what has occurred? It's Mrs. Marshall. Mr. Redfern and I found her in Cutter's Cove. She's been strangled. Mademoiselle, may I ask you a question? Certainly. Can you row me to Cutter's Cove? Mr. Poirot, after your efforts to find Millie's killer, I'll row you any time you like. You need only ask me. Climb in.
Poirot at last. Listen, you know how strapped I am right now with the evacuation, the home guard, and now fifth columnists. If you could leave the investigation, I would be in your debt. I will help in any way I can, my friend. Thank you. You just missed Dr. Neesden, the coroner. My men have done a cursory search of the cove. We'll be back shortly to collect the remains and with equipment to do a better job. Who called you? George Strum. Bathing beach attendant showed up on my doorstep. Miss Brewster sent him. As luck would have it, Neesden was with me, so we came right over. What could Dr. Neeston tell you about that time of death? He put the time of the murder at somewhere between a quarter to eleven and twenty of twelve just before Redfern and Miss Brewster showed up. The cause of death was strangulation? Oh yes, no doubt about that. The handprints are very clear on the neck. Neesden may be able to tell us more after the autopsy, but it's pretty clear a very strong pair of hands did that to her. That's all I have for now. Moreau, I hate to drop this thing in your lap like this. Do not concern yourself, my friend. Look around all you like. Make sure everyone knows you speak with my authority. I'll do a background check on everyone on the island. I should have a report for you at the police station later this afternoon. Thank you, Colonel. Elena's coffee flask. This is certainly significant. Hello, something was dumped here. What does it smell like, Poirot? Coffee. I'll just snip a piece of the fabric from the hat. You aren't going to look at her face, are you? The investigator of murder cannot be squeamish, Hastings. Still, if you assure me of the facts, there isn't any real need, is there? As you wish. I state categorically that Mrs. Marshall was strangled to death by a very powerful pair of hands. What? Oh, Poirot. May I put to you some questions, Monsieur Redfern? How did you and Mademoiselle Brewster come to be rowing together? I asked Miss Brewster if I could join her. Why did you do that? Monsieur Redfern, there is no longer the luxury of playing the little games. Now is the time for truth. Elena and I were accustomed to swimming together each morning. When I did see her on the beach, I... Went looking for her. She wasn't up at the hotel. I saw Miss Brewster getting the rowboat ready. That's when I got the idea that if we rowed around the island, I might find her. Elena. I offered to row first. We set off. What time did you arrive here? Sometime before 12. I don't know exactly. Tell me what you thought when you saw Mrs. Marshall. Well... I was put out, if you must know. I couldn't understand why she hadn't met me. I couldn't understand it at all. I rode for the beach. I wanted to find out what she was doing. What happened after their boat beached? I called out to her, but she didn't answer. She just lay there. I went over to her. There was something strange. She was so still. I knelt beside her, touched her hand, then her arm, she didn't react at all. Then I lifted her hat. My God, her face. It was dark, mottled, and those marks. Handprints on her neck. Steady. Uh, I'm sorry. She was so beautiful. How could anyone spoil that? Who went for help? Miss Brewster. I have this idea. I wanted to... to protect Elena. It's stupid, I know. She was beyond anyone's protection. I sat near her, and couldn't take that. Anymore. I came over here and waited until the police arrived. 
Is there anything you saw or thought that might help us? Um, I'm sorry. Let me think. Take your time. There was one thing. I heard a noise while I was still over near Alena. What was it? A clatter on the rocks near the ladder. Something falling. Not a rock, though. Something light. I may have more questions for you later. The same colour as Arlena Marshall's hat. That mud looks like it was placed there deliberately. And there's something shiny underneath. That mud looks... A six-sided metal receptacle hidden by the mud. The mud must have been applied fairly recently, and the metal looks shiny, almost new. And that shape, it reminds me of something. It's like the receptacle for a winch hand you find on the masts of some sailboats to winch the sail up and down. I say, and that shape... A smash bottle with a bit of fluid left in it. And the fluid has the distinctive odor of an expensive perfume? Looks like a dart. The carving is quite old. will not be climbing up their ladder. An older ladder that has collapsed. I wonder if anyone was climbing it at the time. I would like to put to you the questions, if I may. Of course. How did you and Monsieur Redford come to be rowing together. After you saw me at Rocky Bar, I changed and was about to set out on my morning row when Mr. Redfern asked if he could join me. What time did you arrive here? We arrived on the beach at a quarter to twelve. We must have come in sight of the cove five minutes before that. Tell me what you thought when you saw Mrs. Musher. Nothing at first. I assumed she was sunning herself. And then? Well... The first thing I noticed was she was lying as if she was sunbathing, but she was in the shade of the cliffs. Then, when Mr. Redfern called out and she didn't answer, that felt odd too. Once we were out of the boat, I could tell there was something unnatural in the way she was lying. Her arms. What time was this? He wanted to row right round the island, so I checked my watch. It was not quite half past eleven. Did Monsieur Redfern often accompany you? No, this was the first time. If you ask me, he was looking for... for Mrs. Marshall. He volunteered to take the oars first. What happened after their boat beached? Mr. Redfern and I approached Mrs... Mrs. Marshall. I could see he thought the situation wasn't right as well. He knelt beside her, touched her hand, then her arm, and he started to lift her hat. He saw her face and cried out. Who went for help? I did. We both knew someone had to. I'm not the kind of woman who would ever admit to feeling fear, but I was secretly thankful when Mr. Redfern offered to stay with the body. I understand perfectly, Mademoiselle. You must have reproached yourself. Is there anything you saw or thought that might help us? No, I don't believe so. Yes, there is something. 
She was strangled, just like Millie and the other woman, Alice Corrigan. Three women strangled in South Devon within a few months of one another. Can that be just coincidence? Hmm, anything is possible, mademoiselle. But I will agree that coincidence in this case seems highly unlikely. I may have more questions for you later. Of course. Can you row me back to the bathing beach? Of course. Would you like to leave now? Yes, thank you. Hello, Monsieur Poirot. I'm sorry. I know I should have stayed at the hotel, but I... I had to get away. It is of no matter, mademoiselle. I knew I should find you here. May I ask the questions? Yes. Can you tell me how you spent the morning? After breakfast, I came here to Sanctuary Cove with Christine, M Mrs. Redfern. When was that? We started off from my room just before the half hour. 10.25. What did you do when you got here? I swam, then sunbathed, while Christine sketched the gully moors. Then later I went back in for a bathe, and Christine went back to the hotel to get changed for tennis. Did you like your stepmother, mademoiselle? Oh yes, Arlena was kind to me. Did your father and your stepmother ever quarrel? No. Father doesn't quarrel with people. He's not like that at all. Have you any idea who might have wanted to kill your stepmother? Well, I hate to say it, but Mrs. Redfern might want to. Her husband was in love with Arlena after all. Not that I think she would really want to kill her. I mean, she'd just feel that she wished she was dead. Monsieur Poirot, that isn't the same thing at all, is it? No, it is not at all the same. What time was it that Mrs. Redfern left you? Quarter to twelve. Are you sure of that time? Oh, yes. She asked me. She didn't want to miss her tennis game. I looked at my watch. It was quarter to twelve. It keeps very good time. I know I can't show you now. I left it in my room when I changed after bathing. When did you return to the hotel? Just about one o'clock. And... And then I heard about Arlena. You filled a prescription for your stepmother today? What? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Just a while ago. Trinol. And where is the Trinol now? I put it in her room. There are evil people in the world. They need to be punished. But Mrs. Redfern isn't evil. I don't want her to get into trouble. She loves her husband, that's all. Don't you think? I think she loves him very much, oui, mademoiselle. Look here, Poirot. There are quite a few more things we should be asking her. She clearly wasn't telling the truth about her feelings for Arlena, or about her father and Arlena never fighting. Hastings, that is a very troubled child. I think it would be very unwise to press her. Besides, there is still more we need to discover about the events at Miss Porter's school for the young ladies. Do not disturb him, Hastings. We may be able to take advantage of his absence from the beach. Mm. 
Madame Castle. Mr. Poirot, Colonel Weston has informed me that I am to give you my full cooperation. He suggested that I allow you access to whatever you need in the hotel, no matter how private. I hope that does not distress you unduly, Madame. Well, uh, my, my duty to the owners, uh, I, but, but I have little choice. Here is the master key. This will unlock any door in the hotel. Merci, Madame. Can you account for your movements between a quarter to eleven and twenty of twelve this morning? Well, I... Uh, from ten o'clock till a quarter to eleven, I was seeing to it the staff were all performing their duties. Then, that the dining room was cleared and made ready for luncheon, that was until noon. It was a very ordinary morning, and... until... Quite so. Did you notice any of the guests behaving unusually? Let me think. Mr. Redfern seemed agitated, underfoot, asking if anyone had seen Mrs. Marshall. What time was this? Between ten and half past ten, I would say. Tell me about the sandwiches and flasks of coffee prepared for the guests this morning. Mr. Lane asked for sandwiches and coffee. He was planning on hiking, I believe. Mrs. Marshall asked for coffee only. Those were the only requests this morning. How early are they put out on the table in the dining room? Directly after breakfast. No later than half past nine. I wonder if you would excuse me, I... Uh, this has quite unsettled me, I'm afraid. Of course, madame. She's rattled by more than the murder. You are correct, Hastings. The idea that I would have access to anything here in the hotel obviously includes the contents of her safe. Think she'll do a bunk? If she makes the... Uh, what was it you said? Think she'll try to sneak away? Huh? Yes, indeed. It is good that Colonel Weston is prepared to have her followed. This may be important. I'll keep it in my notebook.
This document bears further study. I will keep it in my notebook. Interesting. I'll put it in my notebook. This room belongs to Mr. Blatt. Ah, beautiful and without clutter. Quite interesting. I say, what caused that oily spot? My nose tells me it is some kind of oil. A test would determine it more precisely. That will do quite well. If I remember correctly, this must be Stephen Lane's room. A Bible, Poirot. Not so unlikely a thing to find in the room of a former clergyman. Revelation 2.20 Thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now why would he have that particular passage open? Although I am sure that this site would amuse you, Hastings, Waro will not engage in such activities for the duration of this tale. Mademoiselle? Mr. Poirot, you gave me such a start. I'm all nerves. Is all well, Mademoiselle? What were you doing in your bath yesterday? It was such a mess. It took forever to clean it up. It is a little hard to explain that... Well, never you mind. I took care of it. It's my job. How are things between you and Monsieur Will Jinx? Mr. Poirot, the Marshal girl told me that there is nothing between her and my will. Everything's patched up. I am so glad. She also told me that you had a hand in clearing up that mystery. If you need a helping hand in this horrible murder case, you just let me know. I'd certainly like to see what Miss Marshall has stashed in there. Then the combination to their box, it must be found. Trial and error will not open it. That's a rather nasty looking stick pin. More? 
raw green fabric from the ashes, it looks like quite a bit was burned here. Linda's watch. It agrees with yours exactly, Poirot. Therefore, the watch, it is correct to the second. We will not be searching Mademoiselle Danley's room in front of her Hastings. It is not done. May I put to you some questions, Mademoiselle? Of course. I'll do anything I can to help. Could you please tell me of your movements this morning? I had breakfast shortly after nine, say ten past. Then I collected my book spoke with you in the lobby briefly, and went to read at the ledgers. That must have been about 25 past 10. I came back to the hotel about 10 minutes to 12, got my tennis racket and played until about 1. From about half past 10 until 20 minutes of 12, you were at the ledgers and never left there during that time? Not entirely. At about 11, I went back to my room to fetch my sun hat. I... I saw Kenneth Marshall typing in his room. Indeed? From the hall, perhaps? Or the balcony? The... the hall. His door was slightly ajar. Did you see Madame Marshall this morning? No. You did not see her as she paddled her float round to Cutter's Cove? No, she must have gone before I got there. Did you see anyone at all on a float or in a boat? At the ledgers? Possibly Mr. Blatt. At least I think it was his boat. It had a white sail, though. You didn't see Monsieur Redfawn and Mademoiselle Brewster when they rode past? No, I don't think I did. You see, I was reading, only glancing up occasionally. Did anyone pass you on the path? I was on the lower ledge. Unless someone had called out to me, I doubt I would have noticed them. You were, I think, acquainted with Captain Marshall? He is an old family friend. We grew up next door to one another, although I had not seen him for a good many years. It must be nearly twelve. Were the Marshalls on good terms with one another? On perfectly good terms, I should say. Monsieur Marshall, he was very devoted to his wife? Ken, M Mr. Marshall, is rather old-fashioned. He hasn't got the modern habit of shouting matrimonial woes upon the housetop. Did you like Madame Marshall? No. Why was that? She was bored to death with women and showed it. On the other hand, men were a very different story. Do you think her husband was aware of her interests in that line? I think that he accepted his wife quite frankly for what she was. He had no illusions about her. But I could be wrong. Do you know of anyone with a grudge against Madame Marshall? Only wives. But since she was strangled, I presume that it was a man who killed her. Mademoiselle, may I ask a favor of you? You found my typewriter, Monsieur Poirot. I am in your debt. What would you have me ask, Hastings? Could you compare some pieces of fabric for me? I would be happy to. Fabric is something I know quite a bit about. Merci. The perfect favor to ask. You are learning to exercise their little gray cells with great skill. It would seem the obvious request. This cut piece is fine silk. From a lady's hat, I would say. 
The torn bit is rayon, inexpertly dyed, and this burnt piece is from the same rayon as the torn fabric. Many thanks, mademoiselle. I thank you for your cooperation. This room belongs to the beautiful Arlena Stewart, uh, Marshal. I say, old man, are we looking for anything in particular in here? We are indeed Hastings. We look for that which is not here. Oh, that's a big help. Looks like ordinary bath salts. Poirot, open the lid. I cannot taste things. The lid, it is screwed on most tightly. There are red hairs caught in the bristles. No mistaking that color. Alena Marsh's most delightful and expensive perfume. It is the same as that which we found in the cave. This looks important. I will keep it in my notebook. I'll just put this in my notebook. Forgive the intrusion, Captain Marshall. My condolences. Forgive me, but I must impose upon you. Carry on. Poirot, I just saw a shadow by the balcony door. I think someone is out there listening. Ah, well. We will let them listen, I think. Mrs. Marshall was your second wife? Yes. You have been married how long? Just over two years. The marriage? It was a happy one? Certainly. Have you any idea who might have killed your wife? None whatever. Had she any enemies? Possibly. I say. Oh? Don't misunderstand me. Arlena was an actress. She was also a good-looking woman. She aroused a certain amount of jealousy, envy, hatred. Malice. From men as well as women? Mostly women. Was Mrs. Marshall previously acquainted with anyone in this hotel? I believe she had met Mr. Redfern before, at some cocktail party. How did you spend your time this morning? Well, I breakfasted downstairs at um, ten minutes after nine o'clock. After that, I went down to the bathing beach where I saw you. I had a quick bathe. Let me see. At about uh, 20 minutes to 11, I returned here to type some letters. I typed until 10 minutes to 12. I then changed into tennis kit as I had a date to play tennis at 12. 
Who else played the tennis? Mrs. Redfern, uh, Miss Darnley, and Mr. Gardner. I went down at 12 o'clock. Miss Darnley was there. Mr. Gardner and Mrs. Redfern arrived a few minutes later. We played for about an hour. Just as we came into the hotel afterwards, I... I got the news. When was the last time you saw your wife? Nine o'clock. She was in her room opening her letters. What was her manner? Unusual at all? No, perfectly normal. Did she mention at all what were the contents of the letters? No. You did not, uh, pardon me, object to your wife's friendship with Monsieur Redfern? I wasn't in the habit of criticizing my wife's conduct. You did not protest or object in any way? Certainly not. Packet of lies. We overheard them arguing. You will not deny then that Monsieur Redfern admired your wife? He probably did. Most men did. She was a very beautiful woman. You were persuaded there was nothing personal in the affair? I, I never thought about it. Utter rot. Did your wife leave a will? You know, I I'm not sure. Her solicitors? Barkett and Applegood, Bedford Square. They handled all of her business affairs. Was she well off? Well, yes. Her career was very successful, as I've told you. I would expect she was worth in the neighborhood of 50,000 pounds. Hmm, then you would call your wife a rich woman? I'll say. I suppose she was, really. See here, Poirot. Aren't you getting a good way from the essentials of this business? What I believe or don't believe is surely not relevant to the plain fact of murder. You do not comprehend, Captain Musher. There is no such thing as the plain fact of murder. Murder springs nine times out of ten out of the character and circumstances of the murdered person. Because the victim was the kind of person he or she was, therefore was he or she murdered. Until we can comprehend fully and completely exactly what kind of person Arlena Marshall was, we shall not be able to see clearly exactly the kind of person who murdered her. Was there anything else? Not at present, thank you. Feel free to nose around all you like. I need some air. You were right, Monsieur Poirot, weren't you? Madame? You asked me to have patience. And now, Arlena has been removed from the picture. Perhaps. But the manner of her removal is not something to celebrate, I think. Oh, I'm not celebrating. I'm not that callous. But I do know that eventually that door will open and it will be my husband standing there. If you could give me an account of your movements this morning... Of course. Let me see. On my way down to breakfast, I stopped in to see Linda Marshall and fixed up with her to go to Sanctuary Cove. That was about 9.40. After breakfast, I saw you in the lobby. I sketched that man for you at about 20 past 10. Again? My thanks. Then Linda and I set out for Sanctuary Cove. What time was that? I think it was just on half past ten. What did you do at Sanctuary Cove? I made some sketches of the birds while Linda swam and sunbathed. Have you seen them walk, Monsieur Poirot? They quite reminded me. Ha! We will not dwell upon the birds, madame, if you don't mind. As you wish. What time did you leave? At a quarter to twelve. I was playing tennis at twelve with Miss Darnley, Mr Marshall and Mr Gardner. 
How did you know the time? Linda had a watch. I asked her. I see. And then? I packed up my sketching things and went back to the hotel. What was Mademoiselle Linda doing when you left the beach? Oh, Linda went into the sea again. Did Linda Marshall actually enter the sea before you left the beach? Yes. Oh, yes, she ran down the beach. I heard her splashing in the waves as I climbed the path. What happened after you went back to the hotel? I changed into my tennis things and went to the tennis court where I met the others. We played two sets and were just going in when the news came about. About Mrs. Marshall. How did you feel when you learned of Madame Marshall? It was a horrible thing to happen. Yes, yes, but you were so very surprised? I think I see what you mean. No, I was not perhaps surprised. Shocked, yes, but she was the kind of woman. She was the kind of woman to whom such a thing might happen. Yes, madame, that is the truest and most significant thing that has been said to Poirot today. A rather touching photograph. Mrs. Redfern's sketching supplies. I think this room belongs to Major Barry. I believe we've damaged Major Barry's suitcase sufficiently, Hastings. Afternoon, Mr. Poirot. Terrible thing, this murder. I hope you get to the bottom of it. Need a little stimulation to help you think. Choose from the menu, if you like. I say, <laughs> some tasty concoctions here, Poirot. Sorry, sir. All out of dark Roman grenadine, I'm afraid. Blame George. It's his favorite drink. Allow me their contribution. Dark rum. I can certainly use this. Thank you, sir. I say, <laughs> some tasty concoctions here, Poirot. A good detective knows even the most useful tools have their proper time and place.
Afternoon, Mr. Poirot. Terrible thing, this murder. I hope you get to the bottom of it. Need a little stimulation to help you think? Choose from the menu, if you like. I say, <laughs> some tasty concoctions here, Poirot. Sorry, sir. All out of dark Roman grenadine, I'm afraid. Blame George. It's his favorite drink. Allow me their contribution. Grenadine? I can't imagine where you found it, but thank you, sir. This will do nicely. I can now make planters punch again. There you go. Messy. May I have a word with you? Colonel Weston told us to cooperate with you, Mr. Poirot, and of course we will, in any way we can. But this has been a very bad shock to me, and Mr. Gardner is always very, very careful of my health. Isn't that so, Walkley? Yes, darling. Mrs. Gardner is very sensitive. I appreciate your speaking with me. You spent the morning here overlooking the beach? Yes, we did. And not the slightest idea in our minds of what was happening just around the corner in that little cove. And you were here the entire time? Yes, both of us. From nearly half past ten, ten twenty-five, until Oakley went to play tennis at twelve. Isn't that right, Oakley? Uh, well, not exactly. I did run off to fetch your purple wool, if you'll remember. That was around 11 by the hotel clock. It took quite a few minutes to find it, I'm afraid. 15 minutes, possibly 20. No more than 10 minutes, surely. I barely missed you. Methinks she protests too much, Poirot. What is she frightened of? It is a question we must learn the answer to, my friend. Did you see Madame Marshall at all today? We? Oh, but that is to say, no, no. I said to Oakley, why, wherever can she have got to this morning? First her husband comes looking for her, and then that good-looking young man, Mr. Redfern. I always wondered, why must he go running after that woman when he has that nice, pretty wife all of his own, didn't I, Oakley? Yes, darling. She can babble all she likes, but I heard that hesitation, Poirot. Did you notice anything that might have a bearing upon the case? Why, no. I don't think so. Just that she was always around with young Redfern. Anyone can tell you that. Did her husband mind, do you think? Captain Marshall is a very reserved man. That is all the questions I have for the moment. We're devastated. We know nothing that could help. Aren't we, Oakley? Yes, darling. I must speak with you. Sir, Colonel Weston says I should answer any questions you might have. Murder? Isn't it horrible? It is indeed. What can you tell me about the murder? Nothing. Nothing at all. I had to go rake that tennis court again this morning. I was there from half past ten until several of the guests turned up to play around twelve. Can you believe somebody had been digging it up? Well, that is terrible. I am sorry you were put to so much trouble. Oh, that's all right. It's not as if you did it. This is a washout. He knows nothing. He can still be useful, Hastings. See if you can find out how. Do you know anything of fifth columnists operating along this coast? Fifth columnists? You mean spies? Traitors? No. No? But then he would not be likely to. Try again, Hastings. I saw Tom Cutter's ghost last night. You did? 
Now folk will believe me. They thought it was just the liquid carriage making me see things. Now is this useful, may I ask? You told me you will be the Navy Frogman soon. Yes, sir. I hope this murder doesn't hold things up. You can swim deep as well as fast? I should hope so. Mademoiselle Brewster tells me something was thrown into the rocky bath. Do you think you could swim down and find it? I suppose I could under ordinary circumstances, but this murder has right unmanned me. If I had something that would brace me up, that might do it. Liquid carriage, if you catch my meaning. A stings, a stings, a stings? Have you learned nothing from Poirot? At least now we know the service George can perform for us. We lack only the means to enlist his aid. Oh, merci, Monsieur George. I will speak with you again. You know where to find me, sir. Hey, Stings, those are expensive. Talk to George first before giving him the drink. A planter's punch. This will do nicely. Thank you, sir. That certainly restored my nerves wonderfully. Now then, you had a bit of diving you wanted me to do. No luck yet, sir, but I'll have another go. This it, sir. Just a small glass bottle. do you? Yes, please. On me way. I run errands for the hotel guests when I can. I'll fetch things from Kingsbridge that they can't find at the chemists here in Leathercombe Bay. I've got my own motorboat and can take guests fishing too. Though with U-boats around these days, nobody wants to do much fishing. The substance in Monsieur Blatt's suitcase is the oil for the protecting of a gun from rust hastings. The substance on the stick pin, it is candle wax. <coughs> the 
The liquid in the unmarked bottle from Madame Masher's bath is the color that made her hair such a striking shape? That is not such a good idea. The good detective knows. The substance in Alena's coffee? It is Triana, a powerful sedative. The bottle thrown from the balcony? It contained artificial suntan. The substance contained in the smashed bottle found in Cutter's Cove? It is perfume? Almost there. Hastings, this is important. Would you not agree? Thank you, sir. I'll send it off at once. Thank you, sir. I'll send it off directly. What can I do for you, Mr. Poirot? You have heard of the terrible tragedy? The murder of that wonderful actress, Mrs. Marshall? Oh, yes. I have been asked to investigate. Well, I'm sure you'll clear it up as fast as you found my missing post. Merci, madame. Did you see any of the hotel guests this morning? Yes. Major Barry came in around half past nine. He wanted to use the phone. Hmm. Then he declared it wasn't private enough for his needs and said he'd drive into Kingsbridge instead. What do you suppose was so private he couldn't call from here? It's not as if I'm one to gossip. Of course not. Did you see anyone else? Yes. That young stepdaughter of Mrs. Marshall's came in to refill a prescription for her. What was the prescription? A sedative. Trianol. When was Mademoiselle Marshall here? Why, it was only a little while ago. Right before I heard the news of the murder. Hold on. Arlena was well dead by that time. Indeed. She had no more need of the sedatives. Thank you, Madame Hughes. That is all my questions. Poirot, any indications yet in Arlena Marshall's murder? Indications, yes, but there is still work to be done, Colonel. Of course, of course. How can I help? Has the body been moved from Cutter's Cove? Yes. Dr. Neesden is performing the autopsy right now in Kingsbridge. Did your men uncover anything new from the murder scene? No, nothing, I'm afraid. 
Have you an answer from Scotland Yard on the sketch? Yes. Goes by the name of John North. Here's the report. I will copy the important points into my notebook. Nasty bit of goods there. Hate to hear he's in my district. Have you the report on the Alice Corrigan case? Here you are. As I said, it wasn't my district. Chief Constable in charge did all he could. Eventually he turned it over to Scotland Yard. They have a couple of men on it, I believe. Merci beaucoup. I will make the notes of my own. The husband's alibi looks unbreakable, and there are no other real suspects. Do you have the background checks on their suspects? Not yet, I'm afraid. Mrs. Castle is very nervous. She may attempt the escape. We're ready to follow if she does. I have here the letter, written to Elena, signed only J.N. Do you think you could have Scotland Yard ask among her acquaintances in London if they can identify this man? J.N.? It's not much to go on. Do you have anything else? This photograph of the Red Ferns was taken by a Jimmy Nash, as you can see from the reverse side. Ah, uh, yes. I will ask Monsieur Redfern if he knows Monsieur Nash, but please send it along to Scotland Yard as well. It may help. Of course. Thank you, Monsieur. Have you any dark room? Nary a drop, I'm afraid. With trade being as slow as it is, nah, there's not much sense in restocking. Hello, Poirot. Seems like the old place isn't so dull anymore. No, it is not. Proceed with care, Hastings. We have need of Monsieur Blatt's assistance. Righto. Where were you from a quarter to eleven and twenty of twelve this morning? Easy. I put out in my yawl about nine, then spent the morning zipping up and down the bay. Just got back a few minutes after one and heard the news about the murder. Ghastly business. Could you see Cutter's Cove from your boat? Well, yes. I suppose I could have, but I wasn't looking, I'm afraid. Can you shed any light on the murder? If I was looking for a suspect, I couldn't rule out that Mrs. Redfern. Jealousy, you know. Led to trouble before this. Yes. Unfortunately, Madame Marshall was strangled by someone with powerful hands. That does not suggest Madame Redfern. Hastings! Do you therefore rule out all women as suspects? Of course. No woman would have the strength. We will speak more of this in a moment. I believe you have lost a life ring buoy from your sailboat? How did you know that? I have found it. Your boat is called the Parsimony, is it not? Why, well, yes, she is. A little joke of my competitors in the business world. Hardware, was it? Do not press him, Hastings. That's right. Listen, that boy's no good to me anymore. It was damaged in a store. I've been trying to find another without much success. I even tried to beat Bagby at darts for the boy on his wall, but I couldn't do it. Perhaps I will try a game of the darts. Good luck. He's the best player I've ever seen. Fancy a game, sir? Care to make a gentleman's wager? I will play you for that life ring buoy on your wall. Oh, very well. But it's worth ten quid. Is it a bet? Ten pounds for a boy? That's highway robbery. Only if he wins, Hastings. Ten quid against the boy. You throw first. Oh. 
Oh, I say, that was first rate. A regulation dartboard. I'm not in the mood to talk at the moment. I have obtained their life ring buoy. So that's mighty nice of you, Poirot. Anything I can do for you in return? Do you have their compass I might borrow? Well, I guess I could let you use my compass. Not much use for it sailing around leather come by. Mind you, return it though. Do you have the winch handle I might borrow? Winch handle? From my sailboat? Not bloody lightly. How would I all my sails up and down? If you'll excuse me, Poirot, I have some business to attend to. Don't worry, I'll be around the hotel if you need me. Poirot, do you think a woman could have strangled Elena? In 1926 was the first women to swim the English Channel. I believe she could strangle you with ease, especially if you asked such a nonsensical question. Then we should put all the women on the island to the test. Somehow. Very well. Hello again, Mr. Poirot. How can I help you? I have a few matters to discuss only. What can you tell me of hotel guest movements this morning? Well, let's see. Mr. Lane came across on the sea tractor fairly early this morning, about eight, I'd say, and set off on foot across the moor. He hasn't come back yet. Major Barry picked up his car, thanks again for repairing it, and drove off to Kingsbridge just before ten. Say, ten minutes of... Major Black came in from sailing not too long ago and headed for the Monk's Head. I've seen no one else except the police and Dr. Needston coming and going. Colonel Weston went back to the police station, I think. Do you know Mr. North? The day-tripper gent with the binoculars? That is he. Haven't seen him today at all, but he has no trouble wading across the causeway on his own. He has been visiting Sea Drift Island often? Every now and again over the past few months. Anything else I can help you with, Mr. Poirot? You did a bang-up job on that motor of Major Barry's. Do you have the handle of the winch used for the raising and lowering of the sails? No, but I can probably track one down for you. Come back later this afternoon. Like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. What a lot of police going back and forth. I guess it's true then. The murder's been done. I heard it was that actress lady, Arlena Stewart, who died. Good to have that Colonel Weston in charge. He'll soon get to the bottom of things. And I brought over Dr. Neesden as well. He does the autopsies at the hospital in Kingsbridge. Hard to believe that such a thing could happen here. I don't think there's been a death on the island since Tom Cutter was hung three centuries ago. This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the monastery ruins to Cutter's Cove via the tunnel, it is 11 minutes.
This is a useful point to measure the time it takes to reach Cutter's Cove. The spot that will be the scene of the murder. From the smugglers and pub via the tunnel, it is 28 minutes. And that, my friend, should be the last timing we need to determine how much time would be needed for any of our suspects to reach Cutter's Cove. Of course, they must also make their way from the scene of the crime as well. Hello, another compass. This wasn't here before. And it's smashed. No good at all anymore. A stroke of luck, that. It will make things easier in the end. Mademoiselle, there is a favor you could do for Poirot. Would you be willing to help with an experiment? What kind of experiment? Oh, would you be so kind as to open the jar for me, please? Ah, I see you mean to prove your theory that no woman would have the strength to strangle Madame Marshall. Can't do it, sir. It's on there ever so tight. Would you mind asking one of the ladies at the hotel to open it? Why a lady? Surely any of the sturdier gents could do it. Well, Hastings, this is your plan. What do you say to that? Tell her... Tell her you have a phobia about other men opening jars for you. What? Oh, that is absurd. She will think Poirot is a lunatic. If you won't do it, I win my point. No woman could have throttled Arlena Marshall. Mademoiselle Gladys, I, uh, that is to say, I have the tiniest of phobias about other men opening jars for me. As unbelievable as that sounds. Oh, no, sir. I believe it. Coming from you, I'll give it a go. Who shall I have tried? it? Mademoiselle Brewster. Any luck with the opening of the jar, mademoiselle? Miss Brewster opened it right up. Gosh, she's strong. Merci beaucoup, mademoiselle. You have done an excellent job. What should I do with the jar? It is yours. Take it as well with the sincere thanks of Hercule Poirot. Phobias must be a heavy burden to bear. Yes, please. 
On me way. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Poirot, but Gladys told me about your phobia. And you don't want gents opening jars for you and such. I sympathize with you. I've an uncle who had a phobia about opening doors. If there was no one around to open a door for him, he'd try crawling through a window instead. Then he got stuck in a window once and wouldn't go near them either. He lives in a tent outside Swansea now. Bit of cold some nights, but he seems happy at last. Did Monsieur Blatt report to you that his boat had been fired upon? I'll say not. When was this? That I cannot tell you. He mentions an accident in the storm only. What storm? We've had fair weather for weeks now. Then why would he conceal such an attack? I could bring him in for questioning. Not just yet, please. Again, I would advise only to watch his movements should he leave Seadrift Island. I'll inform my men. Thank you, Monsieur. Abian Hastings, we progress most satisfactorily. The course now is to identify and to remove the red herrings that obscure our true path. Where have our investigations taken us? I will remind you of those moments I considered the most important. You, of course, must decide which pertain to the murder of Elena Stewart, which are additional crimes that, while they may have no bearing on the murder, must still be solved and what we still must learn before all questions are answered and the guilty unmasked. Are you ready, mon ami? As ready as I'll ever be, I suppose. But could I have my sixth clue to the secret of the Finger of Suspicion first? But of course, the sixth clue is telephone. Telephone. Let's see what we have so far then. Power, lamp, desk, drawer, magnet, and now telephone. Thank you, Poirot. I'm ready to hear what you consider important about what we've learned so far. First, what are the mysteries we are trying to unravel? The murder of Arlena Marshall. Of primary importance. We will explore the possible suspects presently. But let us take a moment for motive. What are your thoughts on the reason Arlena Marshall was murdered? Jealousy. More than one person would have reason to object to her attentions to Monsieur Redfern. The murder of Millie Parsons. We now know enough of the circumstances in the crime to point towards a killer with motive and opportunity. The anthropology instructor, Gideon Fell. 
And unless Mr. Fell is on Seadrift Island or in Leathercombe Bay in disguise, he is not a suspect in Arlena Marshall's murder. Yet there were several persons who were either intimately or peripherally involved in the case on Seadrift Island. True. And two points remain to be cleared up. Can you name them? Is Linda Marshall involved in voodoo? The signs seem to point in that direction, I am afraid. Once we hear from Miss Porter and learn what Mademoiselle Marshall hides in her puzzle box, we will have our final answers, I think. Was Gideon Fell the man you mentioned in your story of voodoo? The one who awakens in the night in the greatest of fear? Yes, it was he. Because of voodoo? Is it so hard to accept? If you accept that he himself believed in the power of voodoo? The murder of Alice Corrigan. We know little of the details of this case. Only that the husband was implicated and cleared due to the unbreakable alibi. And this crime was committed near Brixham as well. It may yet prove to be connected to the Millie Parsons case. I thought the police proved that Fell couldn't have been the killer. There may be another connection, Hastings. Do not rule it out. Voodoo on Seadrift Island? Yes, and we have the indications it is being practiced here and by young Mrs. Marshall. The Birdwatcher, Mr. North? Yes, the report from Scotland Yard, which I hope you have read. It tells us he is the smuggler. But of what? Is he allied with the Fifth Communists? Or someone else? The activities of Fifth Columnists. Yes, it seems clear that Mrs. Castle watches. But not in the name of England. The ghost of Tom Cutter. Yes, the ghost who is not the ghost. Do you have any theories as to who the ghost might be? Mr. North. He would certainly seem to be the most likely candidate. Bullets and Mr. Blatt. Yes, Monsieur Blatt is shot at, but fails to mention the fact. Shot at by whom? A German U-boat? Possibly. If it were the authorities, I am sure Colonel Weston would have been informed. Yet he did not find the incident of sufficient interest to tell anyone. He even makes up the transparent lie of storm damage. Why? Yes. All of these mysteries still be developed to greater or lesser degree. Now I will list the characters in our little drama. Do you believe that we can eliminate anyone from any of the mysteries we pursue? Colonel Weston. But of course. Colonel Weston is an old friend with the uncompromising belief in the rule of law. Mrs. Hughes. I agree that we can safely eliminate Madame Hughes. Witnesses will easily establish she was tending to her various business ventures during the time of the murder. Albert Bagby. Of course. While the Monkshead pub does not open until 11, Monsieur Bagby could not have made his way to Cutter's Cove and back again in 20 minutes. Henry Bailey. The estimable barman. I myself can testify that he was in the bar during the time of the murder. Will Jenks. If the misunderstanding between Will and his young lady had involved Elena, it would have been Gladys who might want her dead. But such was not the case. Gladys Narracourt. Can Gladys have slipped away from her duties at the hotel long enough to commit the crime? It is possible, but when faced with what she believed was her young man's unfaithfulness, her character drove her to sorrow, not murder. Besides, she suspected it was Linda Marshall who was playing up to Will, not Elena. George Strum. His hands? They are certainly hands most powerful, and George may have abandoned the wrecking of the tennis court long enough to commit the crime. But his movements are well known to all, in case he is needed on the bathing beach. He could not count on his absence being overlooked. 
And again, of course, where is his motive? Now let us turn our attention to the more likely suspects. Which is your choice as murderer? Patrick Redfern. Again, an obsession that Elena Marshall has decided to end? Their lover spurned? Yet where is the opportunity? His movements are witnessed by many, including myself, until he set off in the robot with Mademoiselle Brewster. Christine Redfern. On the face of it, the most likely suspect? The jealousy for her is the most immediate and intense. Yet she too would seem to have the unimpeachable alibi according to Mademoiselle Marshall. Kenneth Marshall. The jealous husband? Even the cool customer like Captain Marshall may have the fires that burn deep inside. And there's the money motive too. Yes, the background check of Scotland Yard should reveal if he has the reverses in business. Major Barry. For Major Barry, a man who has lived through the violence of war, an obsession rebuffed by Madame Marshall may indeed have turned to more violence. Stephen Lane. A man so consumed by his zealotry, he has lost his position as a minister of God? The religious fanatic is indeed a man who could be driven to take it upon himself to personally destroy the evil he sees. Linda Marshall. Again, empathy? To protect him from the woman who makes him the cuckold in the eyes of all the world? Already she is attracted by the unhealthy interests. Already she knows the violence that can strike without warning. Yet she would seem to have the unimpeachable alibi thanks to Madame Redfern. Oakley Gardner. The likable Mr. Gardner, who takes so long to find the knitting wool and who was ruined by Arlena Marshall? Carrie Gardner. Another who is hiding something? Would she strike down the woman who ruined her husband's business? Rosamond Darnley. The murder of empathy, to protect the man she truly loves. She is a strong woman who has succeeded in the business world. It is possible she would be capable of such an act. Hilary Castle. Arlena could have figured out that she was betraying her country. Self-preservation. I did not see among her many attractive qualities any indication that Mrs. Marshall possessed the instincts of a detective. Still... It is a possibility. Horace Blatt. It is true the man has secrets. He would also have had the opportunity to slip quietly ashore at Cutter's Cove and depart in his sailboat during the time of the murder. Emily Brewster. The athletic Mademoiselle Brewster is a woman strong enough to strangle another as your experiment proved? And we have not determined a sufficient alibi for her, I think. And yet she is another like Monsieur Blatt, par example who apparently has no motive for the crime at all. Voila, there we have it then. Barring new evidence against any of those we have eliminated, there are 12 suspects. Some would seem to have no motive, others no opportunity. But at this stage, we must keep our minds open to all possibilities. You agree? Um, absolutely. Then when you are ready, we will return to Sea Drift Island. It is late in the afternoon. In only hours, the truth will reveal itself, and a killer will face the ultimate court. Hastings? Hey, we are agreed Mrs. Castle may, as you say, attempt to do the bunk. It would be wise to make sure she does not destroy the evidence against her. Time for a raid on the safe. Precisement.
This looks important. I will keep it in my notebook. This room belongs to Mr. Blatt. I say, Poirot, not the usual kit for a gentleman sailor. A revolver, apparently owned by Horace Blatt. The revolver is loaded. What's this? What are you doing in here? I have been charged with investigating the murder of Elena Marshall. I don't believe she was shot, was she? No. Then kindly return my property to me. Unfortunately, we have no choice, Hastings. No, Hastings. I will leave him to himself for the time. I think now would be an excellent time to remove the contents of their safe. A solidly built safe that needs a key to open it. What a signal lantern. It is missing. Why? Oh, Monsieur Redfan, may I impose upon you again? Of course, Monsieur Perrault. My nerves are a bit steadier now. Monsieur Redfan, how long had you known Alena Marshall? Three months. I understand you met casually at a cocktail party? Yes, that's how it came about. Captain Marshall tells me that you and his wife did not know each other well. That's not exactly true. I saw a fair amount of her one way and another. Was your wife aware of your friendship with Madame Marshall? I... I believe I mentioned to my wife I'd met her. But she did not know how often you were seeing her? Perhaps not. Did you arrange to meet Madame Marshall here? 
I suppose it's no good my fencing with you now. I was crazy about the woman. Mad. Infatuated. Anything you like. She wanted me to come down here. I... Well, I would have agreed to any mortal thing she liked. Did Madame Marshall return your regard? She pretended to. But I think she was one of those women who lose interest in a man once they've got him body and soul. See here. I've told you the truth. But how much of this has got to be made public? If it all comes out, it's going to be pretty rough on my wife. I know. I may sound like the worst kind of hypocrite. But the real truth is, I care deeply for my wife. The other? It was a madness. A kind of idiotic fool thing men do. But Christine is different. She's real. Badly as I treated her, I've known all along that she was the person who really counted. I wish I could make you believe that. But I do believe it, monsieur. Have no doubt that I do believe it. Had you an appointment with Madame Marshall this morning? No. We usually met on the beach. Were you surprised not to find her there this morning? Yes, I was. Very surprised. I couldn't understand it at all. Was Madame Marshall afraid if her husband learned the truth? She was a bit nervous, yes. I'm not sure I'd go as far as to say afraid. Was there talk of marriage between you and Madame Marshall? No, never. Arlena was perfectly satisfied married to Marshall. He's a well-respected businessman. She never saw me as a possible husband. I was just one of a succession of poor mutts. Just something to pass the time with. And yet knowing this did not alter your feelings for her? No. Can you think of a reason why she went to Cutter's Cove this morning? I haven't the faintest idea. It wasn't like Arlena. Do you know of anyone in London who might have the grudge against her? Honestly, I can't think of anyone. Do you know anyone with the initials J.N.? J.N.? You mean Jimmy Nash? Tell me about him. Well, Jimmy was just one of the crowd. A photographer. Took a splendid picture of Christine and me, as a matter of fact. But now that I think of it, I did hear he and Elena were an item at one time. Haven't seen much of him lately. I'd heard he got himself into some sort of trouble over money. He just dropped out of sight. Monsieur Poirot, if there aren't any more questions, I think... I think I'd like to be with my wife. Of course, monsieur. I think you will find that she would like that as well. Afternoon, sir. Care for a cocktail? No. I thank you, Henry. May I inquire of your movements this morning? See into my duties, as usual, sir. Uh, cleaning up in here, uh, checking stock, helping make the dining room ready for lunch. Mrs. Castle can vouch for me. Merci. It is true, Monsieur Lane. You remember our conversation yesterday about the reality of evil? Colonel Weston has put me in charge of the investigation. There are some questions I therefore must put to you. I understand. Will you tell me of your movements today? Willingly. Well, thanks to you, I spent a delightful day hiking over to St. Patrick in the Coombe. Started off round eight. The church is about seven miles from here. A very pleasant walk up and down the Devon hills and valleys. I ate those sandwiches in a spinny. I visited the church. Oh, it has some fragments, only fragments, alas, of early glass. Also, a very interesting painted screen. Did you see anyone? The vicar or the verger? No, there was no one about, and I was the only visitor. It's a very remote spot. Is there anything you heard or saw that can help us? 
All I can tell you is this, that I knew as soon as I saw her that Arlena Marshall was a focus of evil. She was evil. Since Eve, woman has been man's downfall. She can drag him down to the level of the beast. Arlena Marshall was a woman such as Jezebel and Aholibar. Now she has been struck down in her wickedness. No, no, not struck down. Strangled. Strangled, Miss Lane, by a pair of all too human hands. Miss Lane, why were you forced to leave your church in Brixham? I, I told you. I became ill. Press him, Hastings. Now! Did either Millie Parsons or Alice Corrigan belong to your church? No, but I knew what they were. A man named Gideon Fell, an innocent schoolteacher hounded by police. He was a member of my flock. Did you preach of Jezebel and Aholibar when Millie Parsons and Alice Corrigan were murdered? The truth must be told. God's vengeance must be proclaimed. Were you fired because of your beliefs? I am not the first to be martyred for the truth. I think that I have nothing more to say to you. As you like. Well done, Hastings. I think that if Monsieur Lane wishes to see the true nature of evil, he need only gaze into his own mirror. Hello? Need the sea tractor, do you? Yes, please. On me way. I have a theory about the murder. What if it wasn't murder? suicide. I know what you're thinking. I know it's difficult to commit suicide by self-strangulation, but what if Miss Stewart was choking on something like a chunk of apple or something? Are there any telegrams for me? I'll just check. Of course, sir. How may I be of service, sir? I would like to send a telegram. Of course, sir. Please just fill out one of those forms on the counter. Ah, there you are, Poirot. What can I do for you? Do you have the background checks on the suspects? Yes, here they are. Any news on Jimmy Nash, the photographer? I haven't received the report yet, but your inquiry got Scotland Yard very excited about something. I will be curious to hear what they find. Good day, monsieur.
Ah, Major Barry. It's true then. Uh, Mrs. Marshall has been murdered? It is true. Shocking. Most shocking. Of course, I can't tell you after being in an Indian hill station. What you don't know about human nature isn't worth knowing. Matter of fact, this reminds me of a case in Simla. A fellow named Robinson. Uh, was it Ramsler? Anyway, he was in the East Wilts, or was it the North Serres? Major Barry. Doesn't matter, really. Quiet chap, you know. Went for his wife one evening in their bungalow, got her by the throat. She'd been carrying on with some fellow or other. By Jove, he nearly did for her, too. Surprises all. Quiet chap like that. You see an analogy to this case? Well, that is to say, never said anything about Marshall. Quiet, but a thoroughly nice chap. Wouldn't say a word against him in the world. You were not at the hotel today? No, wanted to do some telephoning. The post office here isn't very private, so I drove over to Kingsbridge. Had a bit of bother with the motor earlier on, but young Jenks patched it up, so off I went. Almost ran down that fool cat and dog on my way up the high street. You were quite taken with Mrs. Marshall, were you not? You know I was, man. Have the decency to let that drop, will you? It is a case of murder, Major Barry. Poirot does not let anything drop. What time did you leave? Just before ten. What time did you return? Only just now. The drive? It is that long? Well, no. A bit embarrassing for an old campaigner like me, but I got lost. These confounded lanes, twisting and turning all over the place. Damn confusing part of the world. Did you speak to anyone in Kingsbridge? Want me to prove an alibi, eh? Saw about 50,000 people in Kingsbridge, but that's not to say they'll remember seeing me. Was there anything else? Can you think of anything else? Nothing. I'm out of it. Right out of it. My motor car is running like new, Mr. Jenks. Thank you. My pleasure, Major. Thanks to you, Mr. Poirot. I found a winch handle for you. What, what do you want with a winch if you haven't a sailboat? One must start somewhere, my friend. Like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off, then. Gladys and I have seen several of Miss Stewart's films. It's a tragedy she can't make any more now. You know, it got me thinking. Film stars are immortal. Years and years after they die, still up on the screen, entertaining us and taking our minds off our troubles. Did you ever think of that? Film stars never die. Can you roll me to Cutter's Cove? Mr. Poirot, after your efforts to find Millie's killer, I'll row you any time you like. You need only ask me. Climb in. getting somewhere. Hello, this seaweed wasn't here before. A sandwich tin. For heaven's sake! It looks like an army has marched through here. Poirot! The invasion! I think not, Hastings. These are not the footprints of many men, but of one man only, passing here many times.
You do yourself a credit, mon ami. Bravo! A discovery of significant importance. Tightly locked. And the door may be ancient, but that keyhole looks as if it had been recently used. Hello. What have we here? Mrs. Castle's wire recorder. I'd almost forgotten about that. You must test it, of course, Hastings, but do not expect to find this is a box of powdered sugar. Too right. Do you? Yes, please. On me way. Is it true Mrs. Carson has seen U boats off the island? I suppose it must be. She spends hours up in the tower at the hotel. The invasion must be near then, just as they say in all the papers. Colonel Weston has the home guard on the alert. The sandwich tin from the cave? It contains heroin, beyond any doubt. May I help you, sir? No, merci.
like a ride to the island? Yes, please. Let's be off then. Gladys and I have seen several of Miss Stewart's films. It's a tragedy she can't make any more now. You know, it got me thinking. Film stars are immortal. Years and years after they die, they are still up on the screen, entertaining us and taking our minds off our troubles. Did you ever think of that? Film stars never die. These are the binoculars, most splendid. But I cannot see anything of particular interest here. These are the binoculars, most splendid. But I cannot see anything of particular interest here. I will not do that. These are the binoculars. Mademoiselle Gladys, will you help me by answering some questions concerning the death of Madame Marshall? Oh, yes, sir. I'll help if I can. You were on this floor cleaning all morning? Yes, sir. Just like every day. Clean, clean, clean. Did you see Captain Marshall at all this morning? Yes, sir. He came up to his room not long after 10.30. I heard the sound of his typewriter a little later. When was that? Oh, I would say about five minutes to 11. Did you see anyone else on this floor this morning? No, sir. But I was cleaning the rooms, so while I was in one, anybody could have walked past. You cleaned Mademoiselle Linda Marshall's room? Yes, sir. As always. Did you do their fireplace? There wasn't anything to do, sir. There had been no fire lit. And there was nothing in the fireplace? No, sir. It was perfectly all right. Do you recall who had the late bath this morning? Late bath? Oh, I know what you mean. I remarked to Mrs. Castle only a little while ago. I said that it was funny someone was having a bath. It was nearly 12 o'clock. And who was it who had the bath? That I couldn't say, sir. I heard the water going down the waste pipe. That's all. And that's a clue, is it? Of the utmost importance. Did you perhaps notice a bottle missing from any of the rooms? A bottle, sir? What kind of bottle? No, no, Hastings. The glass bottle found at the bottom of the rocky bath. No, sir. I don't think I've ever seen that bottle before. Thank you, mademoiselle. You may resume your duties. Yes, sir. No more jars to open? No, no. That is happily all in the past. Linda? Linda? Linda, dear, I'm having dinner in my room. Would you like to join me? Linda? Linda?
Good Lord, Linda. No. Help. Someone help us. It's my daughter. Please. The doctor was called immediately. Mademoiselle Marshall's stomach was pumped. It was a near thing, but she was saved. Thank God. The trial was purchased for her, of course, not her stepmother. Yes, she is caught between two worlds, Hastings. Not the real world and the supernatural, but childhood and adult. We have seen how she played up to Will Jenks. Was it just for a shovel to build her polo matin? I do not think so. I would advise speaking with her as soon as we return to Sea Drift Island. You must learn if anyone attempted to goad her into it. Whether all of the items we discovered in her fireplace were put there by her? And above all, you must try to put the poor child at ease. She didn't kill her stepmother, and then try to commit suicide in remorse? No, Hastings, she did not. Consult the pushpins on their map. The picture they tell is based on the times we have gathered during our interrogations. Someone lied? Hastings, you may expect a murderer to lie. Oh, right you are. Of more importance is that someone thinks they have told us the truth. Time to unmask the murderer? No, my friend. The smugglers of the heroine must first be apprehended. They are the last obstacle that stands between you and their true secret behind the murder of Arlena Marshall. For them, a small trap must be laid. And so, what do we know of the smugglers? Tell me who you think is involved. North. He's no bird watcher. Excellent, my friend. Yes, Mr. North from London with his criminal background seems an obvious choice. Horace Blatt. Indeed. Monsieur Blatt with the hardware store that is not doing as well as he would have us believe. He earns his income elsewhere. What are the clues to their plan? The heroine hidden in Cutter's cave. It is the obvious clue that... The color of Blatt's sails. Red and white. Oui, bien. What do they signify? White tells North the heroine is ready to be picked up. Exact? That is when North makes his move to collect it, the murder. It throws the plans of Monsieur Blatt and Monsieur North into disarray. They dare not retrieve the sandwich box from the scene of the murder, with so many police tramping about. So, we know three things which will help us capture them. The first, they assume the heroine is still where Monsieur Blatt hid it in the cave, for no outcry has been raised. Second, once it is in their possession, the safest route off the island will be back through the tunnel they have used so many times before. And third, we have the means to stop them in their tracks. What do we possess that Monsieur Blatt must need most desperately to navigate the tunnels beneath the island? The compass! You have it, my friend. The compass is necessary to navigate the maze of tunnels. We have found the broken compass of Monsieur North. Only the compass of Monsieur Blatt remains. And how can we render it useless? Throw it off with the sliver of magnet we found in the garage. Yes, of course. We return the useless compass to Monsieur Blatt. Replace the sandwich tin and the trap. It is set. Now all that remains before we return to Sea Drift Island is the last clue concerning the magical finger of suspicion. Before you give me the last clue, may I see how I am doing so far? But of course. Present the clues you have so far, and your interpretation of them. If you choose correctly less than half of the time, I will give you an additional hint, along with the final clue. Power was the first clue. The thing is powered by electricity. 
A good beginning. The second clue was lamp. The finger of suspicion is powered by the same circuit as the lamp. Yes. If the lamp was not on, the finger of suspicion will not point. The third clue, it is desk. The wires from the lamp to the finger of suspicion are in the desk. And the wires? They are very cleverly concealed too. The fourth clue, it is drawer. You close the drawer every time you operate the finger of suspicion. Your observation does you credit. The power it runs through the desk. The drawer, it is a logical choice for the switch to turn the machine on and off. So, the finger of suspicion is powered by the lamp through the wires hidden within the desk. Closing the desk drawer closes the circuit to allow the current to flow. Clue 5 is an easy one. Magnet. The finger is controlled by a magnet you hold. The magnet? It is here in my ring? There is a magnetic switch embedded beneath each of the oracle-like pronouncements. If the circuit is complete, a single movement controls the finger and the switch is thrown. The finger then comes to rest there. If the power to the switches is missing, the finger moves every which way as I move my hand, never settling in one spot. In this way, I did not need to leave my hand hovering suspiciously above the correct answer to your question. The switch is reset every time the circuit is broken, and the device is ready for the next. And the sixth clue, the telephone. The telephone turns the device on. It is as you say. You have proven your little gray cells are worthy of a final clue without hints. After the denouement on Seadrift Island, we will wrap up this last little mystery. The clue is... code. Some code I enter into the telephone. Of course. Without it, the finger of suspicion will not point to the truth. Only he who dials the code on the telephone can make the finger operate correctly. And now, Hastings, when you are ready, we will return to Seadrift Island to speak with Mademoiselle Marshall. Prepare our trap for Monsieur Blatt and North, and enlist Colonel Weston's aid in their capture. It is late afternoon. Well, that's put pay to the compass, right enough. It's no good now. Mademoiselle, it is good to see you looking so much recovered. Thank you. Captain Marshall, it is necessary that I speak with your daughter in private. I can't allow that. She's still too weak. It is of the utmost importance. No. Monsieur Poirot, I know what you want to speak to me about. I should like my father to remain. Are you certain? Yes, Daddy. Let Monsieur Poirot ask his questions. I need to answer, and you need to hear the answers. Very well, Linda, dear. Monsieur Poirot? Mademoiselle, it is not true that you liked your stepmother. No, I loathed her. She ignored me. That was all right. It was the way she treated Daddy I couldn't stand. Did your father and your stepmother argue? 
Daddy doesn't argue. He makes his point and then is done with it. But they... They often had differences of opinion. At school, you believed an instructor killed Mille Parsons. What? You and your friends had been experimenting with voodoo? The devil, you say? See here, Poirot. How dare you? Mademoiselle? Yes. Mr. Fell, he believed in it. He got us interested. We knew Miss Porter wouldn't believe me if I told her about Millie. About him grabbing her and the horrid things he said. You decided to dispense justice on your own? Yes. We fashioned a wax figure of him. Got the nail clippings and the hair like the book said. Then did the ritual at the polo mat and would made. A pole in the cleared circle? Yes. It represents the center of the world. Power! Then we let him have it with the pins. It worked, Monsieur Poirot. You have to believe me, it worked. Because he believed as well, Mademoiselle, only that. Miss Potter found out what about the voodoo? She said we were persecuting Mr. Fell. I think she got suspicious herself, because she fired him at the end of term. You wrote threatening letters to your stepmother? I wanted to scare her. So she would be more susceptible to your magic? Yes. It sounds so stupid to say it like this. No, mademoiselle. Children are often powerless to help those they love. But you had felt your power at school. Is it not so? Yes, you're right. I did. I thought I could do something to stop her. I stole Rosmond's typewriter and hid it in Mrs. Redfern's room, so she would be blamed for the notes. That was wicked, I know. You created another doll. This morning early, I went out to the monastery ruins and performed the ritual again. Je vous ai battu. Je vous casse. Je vous mordi. Then I came back here and burnt everything. A little later, I heard she was dead. Don't you see? I thought it had worked. Just like with Mr. Fell. But, but I didn't want her dead, not really. I just wanted her out of our lives. Forever. Linda, dear. Oh, my child. I'm so sorry. Mademoiselle, did anyone tell you to take your own life? No. It seemed the only thing I could do. I will list for you the things I have found. All right. The book of voodoo rituals? The key to the monk's door behind which you hid the wire recorder? The stick pin in the hat with some wax still adhering to it? The hairbrush? The melted wax in the fireplace? Human hair burned in the fireplace? Green fabric burned in the fireplace? That is all, I think. But hang on. That's not right. Something? It is missing? No, that green fabric. I have no idea where that came from. I didn't burn that. Do you see it, Hastings? Even as she puts the typewriter in the room of Christine Redfern to throw suspicion on her, someone has the same idea. As I said, the pieces of green fabric that do not match the hat of Mrs. Marshall are a significant clue. Mademoiselle, why did you try to take your own life? After I talked to you, I came back to my room. I saw someone had been sifting through my fireplace. Then later, my puzzle box had been opened. But Linda, you can't have believed, not really, that voodoo killed Arlena? No, but I knew what would happen. Daddy, I know in spite of everything you loved her. And when the truth came out, and you found out what I had done, I knew you wouldn't love me anymore. Oh, my dear girl, I'll always love you. If you believe nothing else, believe that. Oh, Daddy. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Hastings, we are done here.
cheese is in the trap. Excellent. One more step on me. Colonel Weston must be here to make the arrest. Here is your compass, Monsieur Blatt. I thank you for allowing me to borrow it. It's about bloody time, too. Look, isn't there someone else you can bother for a while? do you? Yes, please. On me way. I have a theory about the murder. What if it wasn't murder? It's suicide. I know what you're thinking. I know it's difficult to commit suicide by self-strangulation. But what if Miss Stewart was choking on something like a chunk of apple or something? You seem in a very good mood, young man. I'm about to make ten quid, and won't Gladys be pleased? What is the source of your good fortune? It's the funniest thing. One of the... um... one of the guests at the hotel is paying me to help play a joke on somebody. I'm to lay off the island this evening in my motorboat, and when he signals from the hotel tower, I'm to pick him up and run him over to Thurlstone. It's a surprise for someone, but I don't know any more than that. We must learn more, Hastings. Who is paying you? Oh, I can't tell you that, sir. I gave my word, and he wouldn't pay up if I said. When is this joke to take place? I've no idea. I'm just to wait off the south side of the island until I see a signal from the tower. Then I head into Cutter's Cove and pick him up. The lantern missing from their safe? It is now explained? Is it far to Thurston? Oh, no, sir. Just a short run across the bay. Easiest money I've ever made. And what is the signal? Oh, sir, I'm not sure I can tell you that. Where can be the harm? You do not reveal the name as you promised after all. There is another five in it for you. Five pounds, Hastings. I think you would not be so free with the money if it were yours. All in a good cause. Five quid more? This is my lucky day indeed. I hear you are, my friend. Five pounds, as promised. Much appreciated, I'm sure. It's just a signal with the light. Three short flashes. Quickly, Hastings. Consult the codes in your notebook. Choose one that will be the joke on our adversary. Three long. Oui, but of course. Fire on this position? Poirot, this is a rather bloodthirsty joke, wouldn't you say? When the time comes, you can warn him if you like. Monsieur Jenks, your humorous friend cannot flash the three short lights out into the sea. Why not? That is the home guard code for announcing you have spotted the enemy. Is it really? That wouldn't do at all. No, indeed. Three long flashes is the code for no enemy ship sighted. Three long flashes. Got it. No harm done. I have plenty of time to warn him. I'm certainly glad I told you. I may even get another tip for warning... the guest. If you'd excuse me, Mr. Poirot, I have to close up. Good day, monsieur.
Hello, Poirot. Have there been any new developments? I'll say. What of Mrs. Kessel? She met with certain individuals in Exmoor, then hopped a train to Southampton. Trying to leave the country is my guess. She'll be detained the moment she tries to board a ship. You are watching her associates, I assume? Scotland Yard is on it. Any report on Gideon Fell? He's being questioned as we speak. I hope to have some information before the night is over. What of Monsieur Jimmy Nash? Nothing yet, Poirot. But Scotland Yard has promised to bring through sometime tonight. It is time to clear up our remaining mysteries. I need your help. Anything. Your men must watch the causeway and stop anyone who tries to leave. My men will be ready. Anything else? We must settle this business of the heroine. Tell me what you need. Accompany me to Cutter's Cave. I'm ready to leave when you are. What else? We are ready to return to Cutter's Cave. Colonel, perhaps you should descend to Cutter's Cove by the ladder. I will ask Mademoiselle Brewster to conduct me there. Why don't we both take the ladder? Tell him the smugglers might try to escape by boat. If the smugglers try to flee by boat, I shall be ready. If they try to make their escape via the ladder, you will be there to apprehend them. On my way. Thank you, Hastings. You appreciate my suspicions of the ladder. Do they see? It does not appear too rough. Poirot, you can't fly to Cutter's Cove. Fly? No, no. Flying is not for Poirot. Can you row me to Cutter's Cove? Mr. Poirot. After your efforts to find Millie's killer, I'll row you any time you like. You need only ask me. Climb in. An older ladder that... I say, the heroine is gone. We can't leave by boat, and your bloody compass is useless. I don't understand it. Compass worked fine before I landed to... Oh, hoaxed it, did you? I am afraid so. Clever, aren't you? Oui? May I borrow that compass once more? I guess you've earned it. I'll take the sandwich tin, if you don't mind. A few questions only to satisfy my curiosity. You received the shipments from a larger vessel at sea? Yes. Monsieur North, you picked them up in Cutter's Cave. Yes, once I saw the all-clear signal. You used a signal light? No. The cells, of course. Of course. Red to tell Monsieur North the shipment it was not ready. White to inform him that he could pick it up using the tunnel from the smuggler's rest. That's right. I'd nicked a spare key months ago when the place was still open. Worked quite well for us until a U-boat took some pot shots at me when I was making the rendezvous at sea. Too dangerous now. That was to be our last shipment for a while until we could find another way. The war, it is an inconvenience. You can say that again. Playing the ghost was your idea, Mr. North? Not likely. Vlad thought it would scare off any nosy locals. I thought it was bloody silly. I think that concludes our business here. Colonel Weston, if you could hand Monsieur North over to your men, I would like Monsieur Vlad to join us this evening in the dining room. It's your show, my friend. I'd shoot you, Poirot. Somebody stole my gun. Ebian Hastings, the murder of Millie Parsons, it is now explained. The fifth columnist has fled and will hopefully lead Scotland Yard to other traitors. The practitioner of the voodoo has been revealed. 
The smugglers have been trapped with the goods, as you say. Only one target remains, the murderer of Alena Musher. Then you knew by now who had murdered Alena Stewart? But of course. All of the clues are now in your possession as well. Hastings, the time it has arrived. The crowning glory of any case. That sublime moment when the spotlight shines down. A hush descends upon the audience, and all eyes turn to Poirot. Tonight, however, the stage, it shall be yours. Some will listen in relief, others in anger at what must be revealed. And some will listen in fear as the net of truth slowly, inexorably tightens about them. Now one thing only before we begin. Do you wish Poirot's help? I can whisper in your ear and guide you, or if you feel brave, I will sit back and let you present the case your own little grey cells have constructed for you. What then is it to be? I'd like to give it a try on my own. I salute you, my friend, and wish you bon chance. Well, that is to say, Hastings, pull yourself together. You wanted to present this summation on your own. Get on with it. Yes, we. Oui. Mesdames et messieurs, we are gathered here to learn the facts behind the death of Elena Marshall. Two matters I will touch on briefly first. Mrs. Castle, our hostess, will not be joining us. She has fled the island, carefully shadowed by the police. Good God, ma'am. Do you mean to say she murdered Mrs. Marshall? No, none at all. But for some time she has been in the employ of this nation's enemies. Rest assured, she will be arrested the moment she leads the police to her co-conspirators. Also, Monsieur Horace Blatt and a day tripper by the name of North have been taken into police custody. What's he done? He was arrested with a considerable quantity of heroin in his possession. Blatt murdered Mrs. Marshall, then? No. Fifth columnist? The drug smugglers, as I recall, Mr. Blatt. You thought this a rather dull place for a holiday. And now we must turn our attention to murder. In order to understand the crime, it is necessary to separate the clues to its nature from the many red herrings that obscured our path. Once that is accomplished, we are left with the truth. Let us begin with the comparison of two bottles. The two bottles I compared were, of course... Perfume bottles. I speak of the two perfume bottles. The first bottle was in Madame Marshall's bath. She had applied the perfume before leaving on her float this morning, as I myself remarked. Why would she need a second bottle? And why was it found in the cave? Next, we come to another comparison, and for this we owe much to the expertise of Mademoiselle Darnley. Three pieces of green fabric. A torn piece of fabric was found near the cave in Cutter's Cove. Another piece of green fabric was found in the fireplace of Linda Marshall. They appeared to be the same fabric as that of Madame Marshall's hat. In fact, Mademoiselle Darnley was able to tell at a glance that neither was the silk from the hat. I will now turn to another curious incident of this morning. Someone threw a bottle from the hotel balcony. It narrowly missed Mademoiselle Brewster. Why dispose of an unneeded bottle in such a fashion when there are convenient dustbins? The contents of the bottle was also surprising. Artificial suntan. Testing proved the bottle it had contained artificial suntan. But the weather, it has been most agreeable. The sun, it shines every day. Who would need such a thing? Then there was the contents of Madame Marshall's flask. Trianol. Her coffee was laced with a heavy dose of the sedative trianol. Instead of reviving her, it would almost certainly have put her into a deep sleep. Taken separately, the clues, they mean little. But together, 
A bath where there should have been none? Duplicate perfume bottles? Fabric for the hat that is very much alike, yet not the same? Artificial suntan when the sun it shines brightly? These suggested at once to me a single thought alone. Someone wanted to impersonate Arlena Marshall. Someone wanted to duplicate the hat of Mrs. Marshall, her deep tan, even her scent. And how can we determine when this impersonation has taken place? It is a sound which gives us the clue. The sound of running water. An odd thing, that running water. It was heard both by Poirot and the maid Gladys Naricot. It was very late in the morning for someone to be taking a bath. And as I observed when I had occasion to use my own bath yesterday at an unusual hour, the sound, it is very noticeable in a quiet hotel. Why would someone need to run a bath so late in the morning, if all had already risen and breakfasted? Poirot's shoes begin to fit you, Hastings. To remove the artificial suntan. To wash off the artificial suntan, perhaps? The bottle, of course, it is thrown into the sea after the suntan is applied, narrowly missing Mademoiselle Brewster. It becomes clear, does it not, that someone impersonated Madame Marshall this very morning, very near to the time of her murder. But why? To provide an alibi for the murderer. Precisement. I have calculated the time it would take for every person on this island to reach Cutter's Cove, murder Madame Marshall, and come away again between 20 of 11 and 15 minutes to 12. And I tell you that only Mademoiselle Darnley can have done it. Monsieur Poirot. Comme vous, Mademoiselle? You were the only one close enough. Yet the nature of the crime, strangulation by powerful hands, eliminates you. Captain Marshall was typing their letters. Linda Marshall and Mrs. Redfern were together at Sanctuary Cove. Monsieur Redfern is in plain sight of several people, both guests and hotel staff. Mrs. Castle tends to her duties. The gardeners were together above the bathing beach, except when Monsieur Gardner goes to fetch the knitting wool. Despite Madame Gardner's apprehensions, he would still not have had enough time to do the deed. Mademoiselle Brewster swims, converses with Poirot and Rose. Monsieur Blatt sails, Major Barry gets lost, Monsieur Lane hikes. What about the tunnels? Ah yes, they're tunnels. They would certainly allow someone to reach Cutter's Cove undetected if their secret were known. But they do not make the trip there any shorter. Whether you travel from the smuggler's rest to Cutter's Cove, or the monastery ruins to Cutter's Cove via path or tunnel? That time it is almost the same. And without a compass, you may rest assured the trip would be much longer. The method of murder? Strangulation by a powerful pair of hands? Only a man or a strong woman could have done it. It is true there is a woman in this room who could have done it. Mademoiselle Brewster. Uh, forgive me. Not at all. I believe in keeping fit. This fact helps us to eliminate Madame Castle, Madame Gardner, Madame Redfern, Mademoiselle Darnley, and Mademoiselle Linda Marshall as the strangler. Strangulation, yes. A method of murder seen before in Devon. A schoolgirl named Millie Parsons. A housewife named Alice Corrigan. One murdered only a few weeks after the other earlier this year. One of these murders is connected only slightly to the death of Arlena Marshall. But the perpetrator of the other is far more intimately involved. The murderer of Alice Corrigan. Alice Corrigan and Arlena Marshall were murdered by the same man. How does Poirot know this? The unbreakable alibi. The primary suspect in Alice Corrigan's murder also had the unbreakable alibi just as we face here. An alibi based solely on time. Corrigan, the husband of the murdered woman, was apparently aboard a train when she was killed. 
Yet in that case, all a certain young lady hiker by the name of Elizabeth Stride must do is give the time when she discovers the body at least 20 minutes before Alice Corrigan actually died. The husband has time to alight at the station, kill his wife, and be gone before the police they arrive. Note how the alibi, it is worked precisely the same. And here? Hear the clue that demolishes the false alibi in the murder of Eilina Marshall is her stepdaughter's watch. No, Poirot. You're wrong. Linda's watch keeps perfect time. If the watch of Linda Marshall it did not keep their perfect time, I might have forgiven certain testimony as an honest mistake. But there was no honesty about it. It was a deliberate lie. The liar is Christine Redfern. You are a liar, Madame Redfern. No! You are the impersonator of Arlena Marshall. And the only way you could have done it is if you changed the time on Linda's watch. You had the opportunity at Sanctuary Cove. You had the opportunity to change it back when you sneaked into her room to add to her fire that cheap green hat you wore as part of your disguise. But how could she change the time on my watch when I was right there at the cove? Mademoiselle, it was easy enough. Turn the watch back 20 minutes the first time you go into the sea. Then ask what time is it as you prepare to go into the sea once more. The watch, it says 15 minutes of 12. But of course, it is in reality only 25 minutes past 11. She is already dressed in the white bathing suit like Arlena's. The green hat, it is concealed in her sketch bag. And the suntan was applied much earlier, now concealed by the clothes she wears to protect her from the sun. At 11.20, Madame Redfern, she hurries to Cutter's Cove, a journey of no more than 15 minutes. I have timed it myself. She finds Elena unconscious from the drugged coffee and pulls her into the cave. It could not have been easy. She spilled the coffee. Tore her hat? She has but a few moments to dub herself with Elena's perfume and compose herself before the robot with Patrick Redfern at the oars and Emily Brewster in the bow rounds the headland into Cutter's Cove. The time, it is precisely 11.40. You have no proof of any of that. Why would she do such a thing? She loves you, Monsieur Redfern, as you love her. Have I not agreed it is so? Mr. Poirot, you're saying that the woman I saw lying there was Christine Redfern and not Arlena Marshall? Oui bien. A little play artfully contrived for your benefit. Each step you were led, each step you thought you saw what you were supposed to see, then after you left to go get help, And then the real murder occurs.
Now, of course, it is truly 15 minutes of 12. Madame Marshall has the time to wash away the artificial tan, change his clothes, and arrive for her tennis rendezvous. Monsieur Poirot, I am sure everyone will agree that I might have had a motive to kill Arlena, but not Patrick. You think I believe in your jealousy, mademoiselle? When your husband, if he is indeed your husband, loves you and you know it to be true? No, the true motive lies in two documents. Letter from J.N. A letter from a former admirer named Jimmy Nash gives us an insight into Mrs. Marshall and her relationships with a certain kind of man. It is clear that he has requested and received money from her sometime in the past. Letter from Arlena's solicitors. A telegram reveals that a sizable portion of her fortune was paid out last week to her. 10,000 pounds to be exact. Do you know anything of this, Captain Marshall? First I've heard of it. I said to Captain Marshall earlier today that until we can comprehend fully and completely exactly what kind of a person Arlena Marshall was, we shall not be able to see clearly exactly the kind of person who murdered her. And what do we see from these two letters? Arlena was taken advantage of by men she was attracted to. Arlena Marshall was a woman who needed to be admired, adored, it is true. But what was the result? She was fair game for a certain type of man who takes advantage of such women. Just as Jimmy Nash convinced her to give him money, Patrick Redfern did the same. And I know as surely as I know anything, that before Jimmy Nash, there was another such man, and before him, another. Arlena was not a predator. She was the victim. That is her character, and that is the character of Edward Corrigan, the man who killed her, just as he killed his wife Alice for her inheritance only a few months ago. No proof whatsoever. Oh, I don't know about that. Here's something even Poirot hasn't heard yet. Although knowing him, he expects it. I sent a photograph of the two of you he borrowed from your suitcase to the Brixham police. Allow me to make this small deduction, Colonel. They have identified you as Edward Corrigan and Elizabeth Stride, the young woman who found the body. Bravo, Hastings. I could not have done better myself. Thanks, old man. That's dashed kind of you. Oh, well, that's torn it. Edward, don't be a fool. Say, that looks like my revolver. You can go quietly to the noose if you like, my dear. I have other plans. Poirot? Shouldn't we chase after him? Poirot does not chase. You damned, interfering, lousy little worm. One step and I'll kill you. I may do it anyway. Here is your chance, Hastings. Warn him if you wish to. Try not to get Poirot killed, please. Do not signal with the lantern. And why not? I told young Monsieur Jenks the lie. What has Jenks got to do with it? That is Madame Castle's signal lantern you stole from her safe that she used to signal the U-boats. I too found the lantern and also the codebook. I told Monsieur Jinx that three long flashes of the light is safe, but it is the code to fire at the signal. I expected you to try and block my escape, but I'm no fool. 
You're bluffing. It is no bluff. Sorry, you greasy little foreigner, but I just don't believe you. Very well, Hastings. We can go now. Stellen Sie Koordinaten ein. Bereit! One mystery only remains, Hastings. You have the clue. Code. What is then the code that allows someone to control their finger of suspicion? When you think you have the answer, tell me and we shall see what we shall see.
I am sorry, Hastings, but you have dialed the wrong number. Bravo, Hastings. That is indeed the code that unlocks their finger of suspicion. You have uncovered the secret of its magic. The case, it is now complete, my friend. You have walked in Poirot's shoes. Poirot, I'll be honest with you. Now that I've given it a try, your job is not as easy as I thought. But thank you for the experience. I am proud to be your friend. And I am honored to have you as mine, Hastings. We have passed the hours most agreeably. Yes, I thank you for that too. I'm sorry, old chap. I should trot on over to the war office, I'm afraid. And so, one mystery solved, and another, even greater, begins. Don't you worry. No more holidays at the beach for a time, maybe. But we'll pull through. You'll see. Oh, I feel like the dinosaur, Hastings. Gone is my world, where good always triumphs over evil. Where the clues, they all add up to the satisfactory solution where the murderer never escapes. This will be war as we have never seen it. Whatever the outcome, mon ami, the cost, it will be high. And I fear our world, it will never be the same.